We start? Must be close to time, isn't it, to start? Yeah. We I think we're not used to starting on time. <laughs> <laughs> And for those who are new, what we do is we present everything that we do for free. Um, the DVDs up the back are all also for uh, free. Uh, there's a set of 14 DVDs. They're all the basic teachings that we've been teaching to people. Um, there are obviously lots and lots of other DVDs available, but they're the basics. Please feel free to take them. Um, they're all for free as well. So. And for those of you who may have had older copies, these ones have been remastered by Igor. Um, so they're lovely quality if you want to have them. And a they're lot better sound. A yep. lot better sound quality. So if you already have the same titles, you're better off getting a copy while you've got the opportunity because it's much, much better sound. Um, we were going to talk about femininity today, but... Uh, we thought we might focus on it. love. It yeah. might be better. Yeah. 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 We, we've got lots to say about femininity, but love seems to be a good thing. Good way to round out the trip. Yeah. It's been a big trip. Yeah. 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 So um, many of you will know, would have known that uh, obviously in the last week the media has... Um, well, decided to uh, put a bit of focus on us, uh, have a good laugh about us, I suppose is the best way to put it. Um, and, and we sort of expected that for some time. So we're, I, I'm personally probably not that um, concerned about it. Mary's probably a little more. Yeah, it's concerned. brought up lots of stuff for me, um, predictably. I mean, I've been afraid about this moment in time, if you like, since I met AJ and... Um, and so while I foresaw what would happen, it still hurts when it happens, and I have a lot of terror about, um, primarily about someone hurting him. So I've just been trying to be humble to that fear yeah. all week and yeah. taking time out for that. So, yeah. yeah. Um, with regard to a lot of what's on there, the, the fastest thing, the thing we can say the most is just a lot of it's totally untrue. Um, and there's not much else you can say about it. As many of you that. know. Anyway. As many of you yeah. already know. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, the media, when they find out that a person probably isn't going to take legal action against them, they then have a, you know, they basically have carte blanche to def defame somebody as much as they wish. And uh, it's interesting where it's going to go in time, I feel, as to how far they go with that. We'll just see what happens with that in the longer term. It's uh, lovely to see all of you. Some from Tassie again too, guys. Yeah. Welcome. It's nice. Yeah. And, uh, and today what myself and Mary, as we just mentioned, wanted to talk about is the aspect of love, but more the aspect of love as the world sees it and not as it really is. How, how about that? So the contrast between what is truly loving and how the world views love, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so that's something the injury we wanted to talk about today. Injured love. Yeah. Um, do you want to join me today? Because um, you were thinking you were. Yep. But... I'm feeling a bit uh, less connected with myself today, but I think I'll, I'll give it a go and I might retire at halftime. <laughs> <laughs> we're in a footy game. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> sub me in, sub me out, yeah. <laughs> 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 now, for those of you who want to ask questions, remember there's a microphone. Uh, Anto has one and Jane has the other. And if you want to ask questions, feel free to ask questions. But you'll need to, you know, hold the microphone up so, so that we can actually hear you. Yeah, and before we start, can we just please, like, I would like to personally thank Jane and Anto and Igor and Lena who have, like, done so much yes. to help us on this trip. Yeah. Um, Jane and Anto have provided this venue here for all of us as a gift and um, done heaps to support us and uh, with resources and food and <laughs> warmth at crucial moments. <laughs> yeah, so. And their only repayment is a, is a occasional meal that we cook in return. Yeah, we have, we have cooked some. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks for that, guys. Yeah. All right, let's talk about this issue of love. Are we both recording... Everybody's Can we just mention as well, um, there is a camera that records the audience. If you don't want to be on that camera, 
Um, Because some of these videos go on YouTube. Can you just let us know now and we'll not put you on? So three people at the corner back there. And Uh, and two down here. You got that, Lena? So you remember that, Lena? Okay. Yeah. Now, if you guys do want to ask a question, feel free to ask a question. We just won't focus the camera on you, but your voice will still be on YouTube. Does that make sense? Yep. So if you do want to ask any questions. If even that's too threatening, you can write it down on a piece of paper and, and hand it to it us <laughs> and we'll read it out. Then you don't even have to have your voice. Does that make sense? <laughs> we're, we're, we're really into asking, answering people's questions as much as we possibly can. So, Okay. Are there any questions before we get started? <laughs> huh? About love. Uh, about uh, yeah. love, if you wish. Sure, if you want to get Fire. the ball rolling. No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whatever you'd like to ask, Kate. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I appreciate this is not really exactly on the topic, but I've just been um, just wondering about uh, if you guys could, if you would be open to just talking about um, your own progress a bit and and a bit about the 14, um, if you feel that it's appropriate to talk about any members of the 14. Um, there's obviously some of you that we know a bit more about, like Connie and Bella and mm-hmm. yep. you guys. Um, and yeah, just I'm just sort of was interested in, um, like have, have the 14 all remembered their identities and how, how they're going with their progress. And I was also interested in, um, in uh, with John who passed, mm-hmm. like how he's going with his progress as well. And I was quite curious about when he passed because his soul was in the 22nd sphere condition, did he pass into that condition or did he have to then work through his injuries from his second incarnation? Um, and also I'm just a bit interested in about the locations of the 14 because I think you've mentioned previously that maybe Luke and Sarah maybe were in Canada and some were in Australia and mm-hmm. yeah, just if you... I think it's appropriate to... That's a lot of questions coming. It out. is. <laughs> That's a four-hour seminar. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. You're allowed to ask them. Um, uh, I don't know if we can comment about how the 14 are currently doing without the f- people who we're talking about being you know, involved in that process. So my feelings are I'd, I'd be happy to talk about what's happened up to now, but I can't really discuss with you what they're currently doing unless they would approve of me doing so. so and many of them at the moment would not approve of me doing so. So, so I don't feel uh, that it's appropriate to answer questions related to people's lives that they wouldn't like to be discussed about and particularly discussed in a public manner. Um, that being said, of course, uh, there's myself, Mary and, and Cornelius and, and Isabella who many of you know and who are okay about discussing about our emotions and our condition and then there are others who were associated with us uh, quite a lot but who have been really challenged emotionally uh, through the process of it's a very psychological process coming to accept your own identity Um, it's it's actually terrifying Uh, you know I met AJ over three years ago now and uh, I went through whole loads of stuff um, where I would have the recognition or the memories about who I am and then I would it is terrifying the most terrified I've ever been and Terra has a you know Terra shuts you down pretty quickly if you're not experiencing it and so I got into very shut down dark places in that first year after I met AJ because I but I'm thinking perhaps we should probably rewind yep um, and put it in some kind of timeline sequence if we can just to give you an idea of like what kind of things need to be dealt with and so forth does that make sense yeah and maybe um, <laughs> it's not asking too much like if you because I remember in Budroom, you used to often start the seminars with talking a bit about your own emotional progress and maybe if you'd feel like you'd be open to that as well and um, yeah and sure. I'm quite interested in like yeah just what emotions you're dealing with but also with AJ like you must be at the very end of your like um, I don't feel I'm at the very end okay, okay. Yeah. yeah if I can maybe what we need to do first is just explain how we're feeling 
about today for myself and Mary. We can't obviously do that for any of the others 14 because they're not present. But if we can uh, discuss how we feel today and then what we might do for you is just rewind and, and present some of the emotions we've had to deal with over the period of time since I first remembered things and then since Mary's been remembering things. How does that sound to you? And hopefully in that, in that process we'll answer most of your questions all, all together. Today my feelings are I still have uh, probably three groups of emotions that I'm working my way through concurrently. My first group of emotions are related to um, my relationship with the feminine side of God in particular. Um, because there is no defined femininity, which is a comment I've made previously on the planet at the moment, because there is no woman on the planet who is at one with God, and historically there has been no woman on the planet at one with God, for that reason, when you come to the planet after you've been at one with God in the spirit world for a long period of time, there's huge amounts of grief about the loss of mum, if you like, the loss of the divine, divine mother. Does that make sense to everyone? And so what I'm going through at the moment is a lot of that grief associated with the loss of the feminine side of God in my life. So once we incarnated again, like we went through this process of connecting to a physical body again, all of the emotions of our environment get impressed upon us again. And in, in our case and in my case, my mother was fairly distant towards men, like she has a very a strong distance between herself and men generally. She's married but uh, has a very strong distance and and on the earth there is a lot of rage uh, towards the male at the moment because of historically what, women, what men have done to women. Now many women are feeling the rage of that and then on top of that when Mary incarnated and uh, I was 15 years of age when Mary incarnated and when Mary incarnated, I felt this barrage of the same kind of rage coming from my soulmate. So, so there's quite a lot of very d uh, deep emotional uh, grief still in me about the loss of my, my other, the feminine side of myself, Mary, and also the loss of the feminine side of God in my life for the last 48 years, or 49 years now. And and uh, so that's one of my large emotions and it's still quite a large emotion it affects my body quite a lot i have quite a lot of pain in the feminine side of my body all the way through but in particular in the lower in the lower abdomen but also in the chest and and that pain is a lot of grief and a lot of uh, unworthy emotions i suppose you could say with the feminine side so that's there for me on top of that um I have a big feeling around my throat at the moment of not being allowed to speak the truth without getting laughed at. Um, so at the moment that's being triggered through all of the media laughing at me and so forth. And so there's this very, very strong uh, feeling in me that I just would love to stop talking, to be frank. Um, and I'm having to challenge that by working through this emotion of being laughed at all the time, every time I open my mouth sort of thing. Because the stopping talking is the avoiding... The stopping talking would be avoiding it. And so what I'm having to do instead is trying to uh, work my way through that emotion. And that's connected to my viewpoint of myself. I've had a real struggle for the last seven years of accepting myself um, and accepting... I have no trouble accepting my memories in isolation. In other words, I, I can remember my life for the last 2,000 years in isolation, but as soon as I have to talk to somebody about them, now I have uh, quite a lot of feelings about that. Usually, the first response that people have is usually laughter and derision. And if you think about it, many of you have gone through this process where initially you hear some guy claiming he's Jesus and you think, oh, you're no, sure. You're right. you know? like, <laughs> now, when you say, oh, you're sure, I feel that as an emotion coming towards me. And, that, and of course, at the moment, because of the media attention, um, there's thousands or hundreds of thousands of people projecting that as well. So that makes it very difficult difficult and then um, also a lot of spirits hook into my own viewpoints of myself so so you know they're constantly trying to create circumstances where people laugh at me uh, because they can feel that that bothers me and and so until I release that it, it's going to continue and um, so that they're the, they're the two primary things 
And then the third thing that I'm working through at the moment is more to do... Um, so, so the first thing, remember, was the mother issue, the se but in terms of the feminine side of God. The second issue is this issue that I've got going on with my viewpoint towards myself. And then the third issue is still some hurt that I have with, with Mary and her uh, feelings towards me at times, her desire. Whenever, sort of, whenever Mary goes into fear, uh, which is happening quite frequently with all the media attention, then, then I feel her wanting to go away from me. It's, a bit, it's hard being with a guy um, from an emotional perspective, it's hard being with a, a person, and in this case for Mary, hard being with a man who basically receives a lot of derision and, you know, and attack. Because it, cause your own life uh, has a degree of insecurity. Does that make sense? Like, you, you feel you don't know whether you're going to lose him at any moment sort of thing. And when Mary feels those feelings, she withdraws into her fear, and then I feel that as a as another uh, loss, if you like, in terms of even my own soulmate uh, can't accept me completely without and, and can't, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, can't remain open towards me under the pressure. So one of the problems that I've had all of my life, first century and now, and, all, and a lot of the times in the spirit world too, is that when people meet me, they don't believe that I am who I'm saying I am. So that's one issue. And in the first century, that happened very, very frequently. Um, and now it's happening even more frequently, obviously. Um, and so, so automatically, there's a lot of sort of attack type emotions that come towards myself, primarily. And less so towards Mary. Mary's more treated like She's, she's almost treated like she's like a silly woman who's somehow got attached to this charismatic man. Uh, and that doesn't trigger me at all. I'm fine with that projection. <laughs> right. So Mary, Mary, a bit of sarcasm there. Sorry. But uh, <laughs> Mary gets really triggered with that. Like she, she feels like anybody who treats her like that, she goes, I've had my own life. Mary's got a degree, you know, she's had all of, she's more well-educated than I am. And, 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 uh, and it's quite funny in a way, considering our history together in this life has, from Mary's perspective, has been very much along the lines of resisting everything possible, really, um, and still feeling drawn at the same time. And so those are the three main emotions that I'm working my way through at the moment. I'm finding it quite difficult um, with, with, uh, and with particularly the mother one to actually get into the grief of it. Um, and I've had moments where I've gotten into the grief of it over the last couple of weeks. But the busier our life gets, I, I, I find with myself I need time sort of almost time alone to get into emotion and when there's all these different things going on it's very hard to um, you know to fully sit in the emotion so I'm trying to take every opportunity I can to, to actually feel through those emotions I do feel that once I in particular deal with the mum issue things will very rapidly change for me after that so it's one of the biggest issues that affects my body and it's also one of the biggest issues that affects my uh, relationship with um, pretty much how I interact with the world as well. So, because uh, I don't feel that the feminine side is protective, you know, nurturing. There's these feelings in me that, that, uh, that I've had not much nurturing in my life and, and, not, and so I feel the feminine side is quite harsh and then I project that onto God, like as if the feminine side of God is harsh. Does that make sense? And, and the reality is the feminine side of God is very, very different to the feminine that we get here on the earth. And that's one reason why Mary wanted to discuss femininity mm. yeah, uh, as, a, as something to discuss. So, um, so that's my emotions. I'll let Mary talk about <laughs> hers. For, that's current emotions. Oh, there's so many. <laughs> uh, I feel like... <coughs> As many of you know who've seen lots of DVDs or met me, like a lot of you have met, met me years before now, um, I have been in a lot of resistance towards this path, towards God, towards AJ, um, and felt very angry, probably for about 
at least 18 months to two years after I met AJ. I really struggled. Um, when I met AJ, I didn't understand what an emotion was, <laughs> really. Um, I didn't understand how to feel an emotion. I didn't have any clear concept of God. I was carrying a lot of injury from my own family about religion, God, uh, hypocrisy, uh, truth, uh, there is no truth. Very postmodernist girl to get away from a lot of grieving that I hadn't done. And, um, and I met AJ and I was very compelled towards him immediately um, and very attracted to him. And, um, but then I met him, like then we entered a relationship, uh, first like a friendship and then it became a relationship. And I just was so triggered emotionally, like all of the time, not just about the truth, but the memories that began to emerge from me uh, with really, literally, I believed that they would not. And I believed that he, he could be Jesus, but I didn't believe in this reincarnation thing. I was very angry about soulmates. I, like, I had every block known to this circumstance right now. You also had a feeling in you of, like, you would wanted to try to convince me that I yeah. was wrong. Because, hey, this is an awesome truth. If we could get rid of the Jesus equation, like, this would be great, wouldn't it? It would be much more I was, I, You know, self-reliant, arrogant, angry woman coming in to sort the guy out and... Um, <laughs> Oh, I cringe so much. I oh, really, I was very uh, angry and self-righteous. Um, and, you know, I'd come I would, on this big humanitarian bent. I was going to save the world through humanitarian efforts. And we needed to talk about injustice and politics and, you know, solutions. And, yeah, all of that was a big angry um, defence over a lot of grief that I had about the state of the world. And... Um, really a lot of the core emotions about the loss of God that I still am trying to feel about. Um, yeah, so it took me a long time to really, if you like, step, step onto this path and go, okay, I, actually I do want to feel myself. I want to know who I am and I want to connect to God. Because if you remember, when I met AJ, I had huge emotional experiences about being someone that I'd never considered being and um, that made me shut down towards wanting to know myself. I didn't want to actually know if this was true for a very long time and um, it's really only been I would say the last eight months that I have really decided no this is uh, I know that this is the truth I know that this is um, what I want to do with my life and I've just been having a tantrum about it basically for two years in just saying I don't want it to be but um since I've embraced that um feeling inside of me I have been on a roller coaster of emotions uh, ever since uh and a lot of terror uh, which is I, I can see was driving all of my rage um I feel very afraid um, to be someone big, to be a big soul with a big purpose. Um, and I really like being normal and plain and fitting in. Uh, um, but I can't seem to connect to God if I deny this greater purpose that I feel that I have. Um, and a lot of stuff has come up about our connection. Me actually for the first time desiring to have a connection with AJ and realising how blocked I am, not only towards men, the masculine, but towards the other half of me. Um, and because I have all this resistance to being us, you know? It's a big deal, as you're seeing. Uh, it's very dramatic for the world and I, ha I feel that I, more than anyone, have a sense of that because of what has happened in the past. And so, yeah, I just feel terrified most of the time at the moment uh, that AJ, someone will take AJ from me. It's my major, major fear. And there's a whole other bunch of other stuff, but I can't, yeah, I can't really, I don't know if you can add to that, but yeah. I, um, I, I feel for Mary it's been difficult because um, for my own progression um, I did a lot of it in private so you know so when I say I did it in private I did a lot of working through all of my emotional issues crying a lot uh, grieving um, and you know accepting my memories in private and I was quite concerned about 
all of them because it, it, because I, you know I started knowing who I was uh, seven or seven or so years ago now, but um, but the problem was that uh, I didn't feel brave enough really to say that to anyone else uh, because I realised that you know what you've seen this week was going to be like sort of a regular occurrence you know and and so what I did was. Um, I, I spent a lot of my time and effort progressing uh, by myself without any pressure from other people in any way, without any pressure in sense of uh, emotional pressure from them, but also without much ridicule because uh, I, told, I told my friends and my family and everything, but of course they all basically disowned me immediately um, aside from my two sons. And so in the end, like all of that, meant that I had a lot of private time, um, you know, that nobody really wanted to spend any time with me. And, and uh, ironically, at the time, it was actually very, very good for me because it, it meant that I worked my way through a lot of things. So I had the, I had the luxury, I suppose you could say, for, for quite a number of years to work through most of my emotions in a very private manner. Mary, on the other hand, does not really get, did not really get that luxury. We, we met when I was travelling overseas and talking to groups of people already and we met actually in her parents' home when we were, firstly, it was two months before I went overseas and, uh, and you know, already there was this the Jesus issue uh, that you know obviously she had to resolve, and then on top of that, her own feelings towards me, and then to actually to actually experiment with that, she had to come and visit me. But to visit me, I was already committed to a heap of things that were public things, which meant that Mary instantly got sort of thrown into the public things as well, and so that makes it very very difficult to work your way through a lot of emotions when you've got this constant public pressure. And so that so Mary's life has been very different to mine in terms of the, her recovery of all of her emotions and all of her memories. Um, so and, and the um, <clears throat> the others of the fourteen have either or the ones that you know um, have either been in the process of processing their emotions already and d deciding they desire God before anything. And before a they memory met arrives, me. yeah. yeah. Um, and even for yourself, before you started to remember, you were in this process for seven years of like emotional growth and development. Mm. For myself, I it feels like I landed with AJ and I didn't understand anything, anything about emotions at all and I had memories and that were very emotional and I didn't know what to do with that. I didn't know how... I in my arrogance thought I was pretty emotionally healthy but I really wasn't and I didn't under and so I got really angry yeah, yeah. Um, whereas uh, sort of the most of the other 14 have had the opportunity to work through things emotionally without having any external pressure at all whereas with for Mary that's a totally different situation and um, and so for that reason her situation is a like I feel a very different situation um, and I feel quite a difficult situation that she's sort of landed in. So on one hand, she feels this attraction for myself, but on the other hand, got all these emotions going to play that she'd really much rather not really do, have to deal with. And particularly the emotions of how, how would you like to have the emotion, and this is an emotion that comes from Mary's past, but imagine, imagine that you've had a relationship in the past where the man was a man who was generally ostracised by most people. He was a public figure and then he got crucified. Right? And you've only just began a relationship with him when he got crucified. And then you have to remember that. And then on top of that, allow for the potentiality that all of that may happen again. That by the time you just get to the point of... Of releasing, of releasing and connecting with the man again, that again that same process may occur. So that, there's a lot of fear in that process. Sorry, babe. Mary, just need to feel that. So for for me, I sort of feel that for Mary, like she's a very. I know Mary for two thousand years, obviously. So I know how courageous Mary is, and. Um, and it's a very difficult situation to actually not only 
deal with the memory of my passing and the fact that she was three months pregnant or so when, when, I, when well, actually I think she was more like six months pregnant when we passed when I passed um, and she'd only begun a relationship very shortly with me very shortly before I passed in the first century to have to go through the memory of all of that and which is a whole set of emotions in its own and then on top of that to then have to allow for the possibility of it all happening again in exactly the same manner is very very difficult and so uh, for Mary it's very very difficult emotionally to go through those things um, some of you, you're now feeling bad you asked the question Kate and you don't need to feel no, bad I'm feeling a little bit bad about upsetting Mary but I know that that's not the truth yeah yeah M Mary does need to feel those yeah. emotions and and as she goes through them she will feel much better about them eventually and um, as, as Mary said she spent a lot of the last three years resisting these emotions and uh, and feeling quite angry and upset and we, we've had in that time we had uh, well the first year after I met her basically we spent most of the time apart and in, even in the second year we spent a fair portion of the time apart uh, while Mary was working her way through those emotions and as she pointed out just earlier when you have fear desire isn't very strong right so anytime you have fear come up in your life you'll find that desire straight away gets suppressed so uh, to give you an example if you're in a relationship and you're now afraid of the person leaving you that will instantly detune you from the desire you have for that person does that make sense and so um, for Mary what happened a lot in the first couple of years of our meeting was that she'd feel a desire f for me just like I do with her and then um, she would sort of start to embrace that desire come together and then all of a sudden um, she would then have some kind of situation like her parents would be yelling at her or, or something about her getting closer to me and so forth or she'd have some of her friends criticizing me because I'm saying I'm Jesus or she'd have you know all these external things occur and then straight away that triggered all of her fears and straight away detuned her from any desire so she'd go away for a while she'd get away from everybody have to feel about all of that and then she'd feel about oh no I still have a desire for him and then she'd come back again and then all of a sudden her family again would attack her or her friends or, or other things would occur and um, all of a sudden she'd feel no desire again and she'd go away again and so forth and this is the issue with fear is when we when we don't allow the fear to be fully processed it actually suppresses almost every other intention and it suppresses love it suppresses desire it suppresses passion it suppresses even suppresses our day-to-day -day life so much actually and in fact many of you probably feel that in your day-to-day -day life if you think about the times when you're afraid it's very very hard to not do what your fear dictates for you to do and that's what it's been like for Mary a lot as well so um, where do we go from there oh, perhaps I haven't given you much about my history in terms of before I met Mary um, so for, for me um, I did uh, if you if I if I look back 15 years ago I've had memories of who I am all of my life but I denied them all so in other words I had memories of someone nailing uh, nails into my feet I deny that I have memories of uh, you know people putting spikes into my head um, and I denied that and I had memory so I had all these memories never discussed them with anybody the entire time I just thought uh, I couldn't understand them uh, I had a lot of emotions about them that I had to let myself feel but I couldn't understand them so so as we do with most things that we don't understand we throw them away <laughs> generally uh, put them on the back burner or whatever well I, for myself I just completely suppressed them pretty much <coughs> when I was around 33 I went through a very very stressful time of my life when all of these memories started to come up again when all of these like memories of the past started to come up again and uh, at the same time I was in I was in the Jehovah's Witness faith in a religion that was very controlling in the sense that if you left the religion you you also left 
all of your family, all of your friends. So the only family I had in it, uh, we're all, are all in the Jehovah's Witness faith. And all of my friends were in the Jehovah's Witness faith as well. And, uh, and so to contemplate leaving the religion um, meant, meant huge turmoil for me. Lots of grief, actually. Because it meant every single one of my friends would no longer speak to me. Like I'd walk down the street and they would look at you and just ignore you. Like, so you went from being friends, like where you felt you had like a really good connection with many of the different people that you knew, to, to basically instant ostracism. Where, so, there was, so I had lots of grief about that inside of myself. And then of course my family, some of my family took exactly the same tack as that as well. And so that meant that I no longer had family or friends um, around me. And because of that, I had a lot of grief to deal with. So at that time of my life, I went along to a psychiatrist because I would prefer, I preferred at the time to take an antidepressant pill <laughs> than to feel the grief. But that didn't work very well at all. In fact, it didn't work for me at all. And so a few, a few, uh, about a month later, I decided I had to actually work through the emotions. So I found a psychologist actually in Adelaide who was focused not on medicating a person but on dealing with emotions and that was like 15 years ago so, so it's quite quite some time ago now his name was Sandy he, he, he's a lovely person and he allowed me to focus on my emotions about what I was feeling about all of this rejection because basically I'd been rejected completely by and at the time, I actually believed I'd been rejected by God as well. So I felt like I was rejected by God, rejected by my family, rejected by all my friends. Um, the, the, all my family and all my friends were... My boys at the time were only 10 and 12. Uh, and, and all of the people that were in our lives were telling my boys they could no longer speak to me either. They should treat me as if I'm dead. And so, so I had this huge emotions about all of that about you know being dealt with unjustly and all those other things but also emotions about uh, just just grief about the the extent of the rejection and and because all through my life up to then i had been in a faith that doesn't encourage friendships with people outside of its faith i also had no fr other friends so it was a time there was a period of time in my life then that um I felt that if I had died, not a single person would have come to my funeral. Yeah. And that was probably true, actually, because uh, there, there was literally nobody who was talking to me. Or If I had died, I would have probably been one of those people who, you know, they were found three months later in the house rotting away. That's how it would have been. Um, because there was nobody who actually even contacted me on a day-to-day -day basis at that time. So, um, so I had huge amounts of grief to feel about that. And uh, what happened was that after a couple of months of talking to the psychologist, I just felt that my mind kept on clicking into play with when I was discussing with him. And actually, I finished up starting analysing him more <laughs> than dealing with my own emotions. So, so what finished up happening was I talked to him about his emotions and his... <laughs> relationship and and so forth um, because I could see all of these things that he was telling me weren't consistent with his own life and his own relationship and everything and actually he was a smoker as well and I could see he was suppressing lots of grief through through you know having having his smokes and so forth and I just realized that actually no I needed to do something else that wasn't so cerebral you know that, that wasn't so focused welcome just come and find a seat if you can um, so I needed to do something else that wasn't so cerebral, you know, something that wasn't so focused on the mind and, and connected me more emotionally. Now, at the time, Sandy had a friend, his name was Eugene, and, and his friend Eugene had actually done a lot of what was called mind-body therapy. Have you ever heard of that? It's a kind of, um, it's a kind of technique where you don't, you don't get talked to hardly at all, and all the person does is sort of put their arm or their hand in certain specific places on your body where you have huge amounts of tension. And if you allow uh, yourself to just continue breathing diaphragmatically, so if you breathe into your diaphragm, this area of your body, 
whatever emotion is locked up in that particular area of your body will automatically start um, f shifting. Your body starts twitching and so forth initially, and then after a while, the emotion comes up. So you start crying and so forth. And that method of... Uh, I found that method of dealing with emotions very effective because my mind couldn't reason it all out, right? So, so many of these memories that I was having and, and all of these feelings of grief and all of those feelings that I was having, um, I, could, I could actually now feel and release without having to talk about them so much. And, and I found that very effective. And, and within about seven or eight months of doing that, I used to do that twice a week with him. And with about, after about seven or eight months of doing that, I went through huge terror fits as well, like just where I was completely, um, I suppose you could say, it was like the feeling was like cramp in all of my body for periods of up to four hours. And then I would sleep anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. Does that make sense? Like so huge amounts of terror just coming out of my body. And so after about eight months, I can remember driving down the freeway into Adelaide and going, for the first time in my life, I actually feel like things are happy. And actually, for the first time in my life, I actually felt like I could see colour. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced that, where you've lived a whole life where you feel like you're seeing everything in black and white, even though you realise there's colours, it just you don't feel the colours. And, uh, and for the first time in my life, I felt like I could feel the colours, you know, like have some sense of connection with myself and so forth. And so, um, so what happened then was I realised that uh, for, that was really a big part of that. A lot of the grief had now gone. I really felt like I wanted to embrace my life again. Um, I was no longer, I was quite suicidal uh, after the time when everybody wouldn't speak with me. I felt, I felt like, well, nobody cared anyway. Um, so I might as well just die. Like there was no reason to live, I, I felt. Um, but that had all changed over that period of time of releasing all of that grief and so forth. And so um, I came out of that feeling quite positive. In fact, I started up my business again. I was a computer consultant and I started that up. But I still had lots of emotions with God, actually. A lot of emotions about I'm rejected now by God because the religion had re rejected me and so forth. I also felt God had rejected me. And I had a lot of emotions about that. Um, a lot of grief that I needed to yet feel that I didn't realise. So, so for the next seven years of my life, I'd hardly connected with God at all. In fact, uh, I spent most of my time avoiding God. And I just embraced a life, basically a life of materialism. Uh, that's what I did for the next seven years. I was still very focused on emotions, though. So, so I was very focused on feeling my emotions and feeling anything that came up. I would just feel it and feel my grief or whatever because I'd learnt through that previous pro process that that was the way to go. That was the way to heal. But with regard to God, like completely closed down. During that time, uh, my business flourished and uh, I finished up starting up four companies. Um, started up two for my sons and I two, two for myself. Um, and um, in eventually I closed down the two for my sons and I focused on the two for myself. And the two for myself, one was a property development company and, um, and one was the, a computer consulting company. And uh, for the next, for that seven year period basically I just focused heavy workload. I'd work 90, 100 hours a week. Um, not much self-love <laughs> during that time still, even though I dealt with all of these different emotions. But I spent a lot of my time sort of getting together what I felt was going to be like a nest egg for the future. So I finished up having 13 properties and uh, during that short period of time, uh, I learned how to develop property. I learned, uh, I was quite good at my computer consulting business and I became quite well known in the region in which I lived for that. And I was charging $300 an hour working with my computer consulting business as well. So I was quite well off during that period of time. Bought myself a sports car and all those kind of things. Living in a home down by the beach and so forth. So that was my life for that next period of time. And I had, during that time, two, two relationships. One was with a woman that, uh, that was in a large degree of terror 
And as a result of that, um, we'd const we, we, we didn't really get very close. And in fact, for the first three years of our relationship, I saw her once a month. Um, so that was, and I had a lot of grief about that because I wanted to be much closer. And, and, and at the time, I felt that woman was my soulmate. I didn't understand the term. Neither did I know that or have any memories about myself or, or about my spirit life or any of those other memories. Um, all of the memories that I did have, I should say, I basically denied. So when I had memories about, you know, different physical things happening to me, I denied all those things. And I just tried to live a normal life. What, what, what I felt was a normal life, which for me at the time was a life where I just wanted to gather together enough wealth um, so that I didn't have to uh, be dependent upon anybody anymore. And also I didn't have to be... Um, the feeling I had was I, I wanted to, by the time I was... Uh, I felt by the time I was 45, I wanted to be able to just retire and just enjoy the rest of my life. And the way I was headed uh, was about that. I was about to do some very, very large developments, much larger, sort of multi-million dollar developments. And once you start doing that, things happen very rapidly. So I was pretty close to getting to that point. When I sat down one night after a huge emotional release about my relationships, because that's... That was the one area of my life that still seemed unresolved. I was pretty upset about every time. I'd only attempted to have two relationships during that seven-year period, and, uh, and both of them didn't go very well. Um, and so, you know, every time it didn't go very well, I would just be gutted with grief, you know, basically. And so I'd allow myself to feel my grief. And one night... Uh, I just got sick of it and I actually turned to God again actually in the one night I just I just said I wanted truth you know and I was, uh, I was being a computer consultant you know I thought oh you know logical thing to do <laughs> was to do a search on the internet for truth <laughs> as if that's going to work right well actually it did work um, I was I was sort of searching and interesting thing, I started noticing for the very first time, and I'd realised that I've had this all the way through my life, but I started noticing for the very first time that I would actually look at a title of something and I'd get this huge rush of what I now know to be love come through me. But, but it felt to me like just this huge wave of just energy and tingling sensations just flow through my whole body. And I'd look at a title, that would happen, and then I'd look at other titles, dead, like wouldn't happen at all. <laughs> and I started noticing this was happening, so hang on a sec, what I did was I went back to the, my original searches <laughs> on the internet, and, and I, took, I actually got out a pen and a piece of paper, believe it or not, and wrote down the titles of every one that, that I looked at that I felt this rush of love with. It turned out there were four titles. Of, like I looked through, I was, I was desperate and I looked through 250,000 items around about uh, and there were four titles that I had this feeling. Each one of them was angelic revelations of divine truth, <laughs> all from different sources. Um, and so I just thought, oh, this is very interesting. I, I, the next thing that I wanted to do is to find, I thought, well, the truth's free, right? Truth should be free. So I, I squeezed down the search to everything that was free. <laughs> and then on top of that, what I did was uh, I then downloaded the first one and I searched for the word soulmate because I just had this really strong, and I had, had, done, had now done, had for the previous eight years this really strong feeling that no, there is such a thing as a soulmate one person for you. Uh, that's just a very strong feeling that I had. And so I searched for the word soulmate and lo and behold, the angelic revelations of divine truth had one entire volume dedicated to soulmates, like this whole thing. And so I start reading and, and everything that portrays is exactly what I feel about soulmates. Does that make sense? 
And I'm crying, reading, you know, and I'm I, like, in joy, not, not sad. I'm just so wrapped, you know, that I've found something at last on the planet that connects me with this feeling that I had inside of me that soulmates is a real thing and that there are, everything that I felt about it is exactly what was being portrayed. So I thought, these angelic revelations of divine truth, they're amazing, right? So I download them all. Right, there's two and a half thousand of them, so it took a little bit of time. And uh, and as I'm downloading, I'm reading them now. Now back then, I only had a dial-up internet line, <laughs> so you can imagine <laughs> this process took a number of days. <laughs> so I had a dial-up internet line downloading all this stuff, and 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 eventually I bought the books and I received the books and and I started reading the books. And interesting thing I found was that. I actually knew in advance every single thing that was going to be said. Now that is probably one of the things that freaked me out the most. Because um, there was no logical, like I'm a pretty logical person. In the past I've been, you know, I've been into electronic engineering. Um, I'm an IT person who's been worked in the IT game for 22 years. Um, I'm very practical and pragmatic when it comes to money <laughs> and, and I'm developing uh, software as well as developing homes or developing property and, on top, and running a few companies very, and very uh, anybody that would have met me during that time would say to you that very pragmatic, straightforward sort of person. And here I'm having all of these feelings that I know exactly what's being going to be said by the person who's giving the message. And sure enough, I'd read the message and it's exactly... Now, now so I, I'm so confused now. Like, I was pretty confused now. Like, how does this happen? And then all of a sudden, there was just this, like... It sort of, like, opened a gateway inside of myself somehow. And all of a sudden... Um, I started having feelings about how the universe is constructed and how everything works and all the laws involved, all of God's laws. I had these huge emotions about God. I, any time I thought about God during that period of time, I'd just cry and cry and cry. And, and huge emotions about God. And I'm writing, writing down and drawing pictures about... And many of the presentations you've seen over the last three years... Um, and now, I've, known, I've met you about a year ago, Kate, I suppose, would it be? That'd be about right. May, May last year, I think. Yeah, year and a half or whatever. And all of the stuff you've had presented to you, I actually wrote during that period of time, over a period of four weeks. Um, so it was just like, like huge amounts of information. And, um, and more since, of course. But, and there's far, more, there's far more things that I'd like to discuss with everybody, but I just feel everybody's not ready yet. You know, there's still a lot about the stuff that I need to talk about before they'll be ready for this other stuff. But, but that, um, that occurred very, very rapidly. And I uh, and also had memories then of there being 14 of us, not just, just myself. Um, and obviously my soulmate was out there somewhere, so I don't know where she was or, or anything like that. I just knew she was. Um, and then I had uh, all these feelings about God, so that's what I focused on first, the relationship with God. And basically, like I said, all of that was dealt with in private. Um, I couldn't conceive that anybody would ever believe me, um, that anybody would ever want to hear about it, uh, their personal experience at the time. And so I just basically, oh, when somebody's come up to me and said, look, we haven't seen you, mate, look, what's going on? I go, oh, I'm just dealing with a lot of things, you know, <laughs> from the past. <laughs> you know, that's <coughs> how to explain it. And they go, oh, you know, most people are interesting. Even the, your closest of friends barely ask you the next question, which is, oh, what things are they? <laughs> you know, and so very few of my friends were that interested in me enough to know what things were they, so they never asked that question. And I was actually quite happy with that because then I'd feel like I'd have to go into what things they are and, you know, that would be a bit crazy. That's what I felt. So, so during that period of time now, I was grieving a lot, uh, working, like having a lot of memories about my life in the first century, my life in the spirit world, and the whole process even of uh, coming back again, how that felt, uh, memories of my childhood experiences. And all of the childhood experiences that I had rem that were memories, all for the first time in my life, sat together. So before then... 
what happened was I, for seven years I had this very I'd been processing a lot of emotions and I and in the process of processing some emotions I had memories of torture like come up uh, on quite frequent occasions actually with the person I was working with and initially with the, psycho the psychologist as well uh, about being tortured and and I could never understand them <coughs> like there is no feeling in my current life that I've been abused in any way and certainly no feeling of being tortured my body doesn't bear any marks of being tortured at all um, and so I, I, I I'm having this emotional experience where, where I'm full blown in like just like terror initially and then crying and crying and crying for sometimes for hours on end um, and often for days on end during that initial seven year period that started 15 years ago and yet I, and I'd release emotion about it and feel a lot better afterwards ironically but still not understand how I could have that experience and then when I started having these other memories now it all fit, fit together so in my first century life besides my death I was tortured on a number of other occasions and and every one of those occasions were the occasions that I remembered prior to my understanding who I was but without any I, I, I couldn't understand it emotionally and so I just blocked that off and said oh you know something must have happened to me was all I said to myself was something must have happened to me I don't know what it is and uh, and that's it and all I knew was that by releasing the emotion I felt heaps better <laughs> so so I decided to just keep doing that because it worked does that make sense and so um, what, what I did after then um, was you know obviously coming to accept that you're somebody who you definitely do not believe you are is a very difficult psychological process so then on top of that to come to believe you're somebody that everybody else thinks they know right, is a very difficult process trust me <laughs> um, because everybody already has their own opinion of what that person is so because everyone has their own opinion all of my experiences feel very different to the opinion so everybody comes up to me and says oh but the Jesus of the Bible did this and he did that and he did this and he did I'm so I'm sorry but I didn't I don't remember that I didn't do that well you can't be Jesus then how does that like I just don't see the relationship there but how does that prove that I'm not Jesus that a person who wrote people who wrote a group of things in the Bible three by the way it's often 300 years after it actually occurred and um, and then I get that directed at me as if I should be that person so so there's been people who come up to me still and uh, in fact I, I got some questions this week um, where you know where's my stigmata marks if I'm Jesus like and I think that's a, such a ludicrous question because in history there's been over 200 documented examples of people with the stigmata now they don't all claim to be Jesus so so how does that have any bearing or relevance on the question of whether I'm Jesus or not now I understand for a person in the audience any person who, who, who talks about it or thinks about it they go well how do I know whether he's Jesus or not well that's a very good question like um, you're going to only know by investigating and over a period of time I feel I, I don't see how you can ever uh, feel it straight away now there are some of you who have felt it straight away when you met me but I put to you that actually it's not your feelings that you're feeling it's the feeling of a spirit with you who's telling you that I am and many of you still have a lot of doubts about it and that's fine I don't I don't see any problem with that but but quite often the difficulty that I experience emotionally is that people are telling me what I should be feeling all the time rather than what I'm actually feeling and people tell me what I should be remembering all the time rather than what I'm actually remembering does that make sense and so I'm just getting so for myself it's it's difficult sometimes because I'm getting this constant like pressure from people to tell for them for, for them saying to me that I should be the Jesus they know but if everyone's frank with themselves not a single person on this planet knows who Jesus was in the first century there's very little record of Jesus personality in the first century aside from his love of truth and his love of love right there's very little about his life in the first century so your Jesus or the Jesus of the Bible that you think you know 
there's very little about all of those things. The, there's nothing about my life from the time from from the time I was born hardly to the time I was 31 in the in the first century. Nothing. Nothing. You look at the period from 12 years of age to 30 years of age. There is not a thing in the Bible about that. Right? About that period of time. And yet people think that, they, that what they saw after that time should be the person I am now. And there's, so there's lots of confusion, I feel, about what people expect. And the problem with being a person who has a degree of notoriety on earth or fame is that everybody thinks they know you when very, very few people have actually met you. Now, 2,000 years later, very few people have actually met the Jesus from the first century. Is that not true? <laughs> so how can they know who he is? Well, they, it's very, very difficult. They're only going by a record that's in the Bible, and even that record is highly distorted. You know, many Christians already realize that they read something in one part of the Bible, and then there's almost a direct contradiction in another part of the Bible of the same statement. You know, we see all these contradicting statements even about God herself. Like, for example, in, in all of the books of the Bible, there is this implication that God is a God of vengeance and punishment, is there not? And yet, in the Gospel accounts, there's also this perception that God is a God of love, particularly in the Gospel accounts being presented. Now, now does vengeance and love marry up in your mind? Like, and if God is a God that is like all-powerful and all-knowing, why would she or he ever have a feeling of vengeance for what he has created. It doesn't make any sense, logically even. And so I feel what happens with a lot of people with the Bible is that they then they grab all that information and then, unfortunately for myself, impose all of that information on me as if I've got to live up to this Bible record of who I am. And, and that in itself is very damaging, I feel. And also, one of the things I would love to correct, and I've had a feeling of wanting to correct it for the last 1,900 or so years. Right? Now, if you had an opportunity to correct something about the truth that has, had, has persisted for thousands of years, and you had that opportunity available to you, I'm very certain the majority of you would have taken the opportunity. Now, for myself and Mary, that opportunity arose for the first time in the spirit world, when we were in the spirit world for the first time in the early 20th century. So, so it was about 1930, around that time, 1935, that we recognised for the very first time that we had the opportunity to come back to Earth. For the very first time. And we'd never come back to Earth before then, between the time that we were in... And in fact... Nobody had ever come back to Earth in that time, by the way. So all the people who believe in reincarnation, I'm sorry, but uh, and that's another burst of that bubble, I suppose, is that there's a guy now saying that actually there was no reincarnation and there was no way of coming back to the Earth all that time and there never has been historically, actually. So, so there's never been a reincarnation that I observed from the spirit world all the time I was in the spirit world and no other spirit in the spirit world has ever actually witnessed a reincarnation event in the spirit world up until 1962. So, um, and of course, when somebody says, well, how can you prove that? Well, there's a lot of ways to prove it, but, um, but many of those ways include talking to spirits, of which most people feel you can't do. And, but on top of that, the people who know you can do it, many of them then criticise it as if you're talking to demons. In other words, as if you're talking to people that you shouldn't be talking to. So, ironically, in the Bible itself, in the book of Leviticus, in chapter 20, it says, it says that any person who is a spirit or uh, who is connected to spirits or a spirit medium should be put to death without fail. That's what it says in Leviticus 20. Now, many Christians believe that that that's how serious talking to a spirit is, that they should be put to death. Now, ironically, Jesus the Jesus of the Bible I'm talking about, which actually was also myself, believe it or not. But the Jesus of the Bible, if you look at the Bible record in Luke chapter 8, he talked to spirits. Now, according to a Christian's own condemnation, they're condemning their own, their own founder of their own faith. Can you see? 
They're condemning a man who talked to Like on one hand, if you talk to spirits, they condemn you. On the other hand, Jesus himself talked to spirits. The truth is I did talk to spirits in the first century and I talk to them now in exactly the same way. They are just people. But unfortunately, there's all this misconception about all of that and there's all this stuff about it on the earth as a result and and again everybody then takes the wrong tack and and before you know it there's all this untruth and and if you had the opportunity to correct the untruth you would definitely want to take it and and so my feelings are uh, both myself and Mary definitely want to take it along with a group uh, a group of other people now for us emotionally obviously when you're the first person working through a group of emotions and I'm the first person who's worked through the group, a group of emotions about reincarnation. And, and if you're the first person who's working through a group of emotions such as those, then, then you're going to have a very different experience than the second person and the third person and so forth. Being the first person to do anything has a uniqueness to it. So, for example, if you think about the Wright brothers who, who had the first motorised flight that we know of historically, and of course that's not necessarily true if you're given all of history, but it's the bit that we know in recorded history. The, f the, first, the first two that did that, often, well, before they did it, they received a lot of ostracism and a lot of criticism. They received also a lot of anger. But eventually they did it, and then of course after that, everybody accepted that it could be done. And then, you know, then yeah, they had the experience of becoming quite famous as a result of their... Of, and very shortly after, by the, in fact, within a period of less than 10 years, you had biplanes fighting in war from their, from their creation, like in a period of less than 10 years. So, so what does that tell you? It tells you that, you know, the first persons who experience something are firstly, they go through this process where everybody basically ridicules them. So the first process with any new truth is ridicule or people making fun of you. That's the first thing that happens. Guaranteed, no matter what it is, pretty much. The very first thing that happens is ridicule. The second thing that happens generally is people go out of their ridicule because see the the process of ridicule is meant to stop the person so see if everybody if all of us ridicule a person it's very unlikely they'll continue doing what they're doing can you see that this is why ridicule is such a very uh, powerful attempt to manipulate a person because if you can ridicule them then from that moment on you can shut them down completely if the person has the emotional injury where they're willing to be shut down they'll be shut down completely but when that doesn't work so in other words when a person is more persistent than the ridicule will will, will get over and all the ridicule will shut down then generally what happens is people get angry that's the next stage all right for myself and mary that stage has barely begun all right but that's what happens. The next step is anger, anger from people. Now, people have anger for lots of reasons, but the majority of reasons why people who are angry is because they don't allow, they don't have inside of them a live and let live attitude. You know? It's more of a, like the Beatles said, live and let die. <laughs> you know, like, you know, anybody that doesn't agree with them, get rid of them, basically. So, so anger is usually the next step. In, in the process of the discovery of truth. And then after they get over their anger, and for many people that can take years, but some people it can only take a few minutes. It just depends on what kind of connections or what kind of uh, what, what I would classify as emotional connections they have with what's happening. So for example, a person who says he's Jesus is definitely going to receive a lot of ridicule, is he not? Primarily from the very people who don't believe he's Jesus or don't believe he's their saviour and all those other things that they believe about their faith. So he's going to get ridicule from them. When the ridicule doesn't work, their investment, their investment in disproving that the person isn't who he's saying he is becomes greater and therefore is going to have a lot more anger associated with it. Does that make sense? And so they go into the anger 
because their investment, their own emotional investment in whether it's true or not is displayed. You see, you see if, I, if I'm a Christian and I was very, very, uh, you know, I was very sure of my faith and I was, and I was very, uh, I was not frightened about what anybody else thought or felt. I was not frightened about how, how anybody else thinks about my faith. I would not ridicule another person, no matter whether he says he's Jesus or not. Because, because in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, it says that you should love your enemy. And if I'm a Christian, I would love my enemy and therefore I wouldn't ridicule them. Does that make sense? So, so if I'm a Christian who's very sure of his faith, I would not ridicule even a person who's saying he's Jesus. Can you see that? If I was really sure of my faith and I practiced it completely, that's what I would do. And I would certainly never get angry with him. Right? Because my, my faith precludes me from doing so. My own faith, I'm certain of it, and I'm certain of my connection with God if, I, if I'm a Christian who's done, who's done that. I would not be angry about anybody who claims he's Jesus. I would know for certain inside of myself that he's not. Right? And I certainly, and I also know that I need to love him because that's what the Bible, Jesus himself, my Jesus, says that I should do. And so I would not get angry. But if I have an emotional investment in it and I am not sure of my faith, then certainly I am going to get angry. Right? Myself and Mary this, this week have had like probably five or six hundred emails from Christians angry. Right? Um, just, just in the last few days. The next step, once you get over your anger, and getting over anger is, is about letting it go, so partly it's about experiencing it, but it also is getting into the reason why you feel angry. If a person feels like, goes through this process and then they feel like, no, my faith is certain. My faith is certain in God and in Jesus, this other Jesus, not this fellow who's AJ who calls himself Jesus. And, and they feel all of that themselves. <coughs> The next step, if there is any next step, will be investigation. I either decide to investigate or I decide to leave it alone. Right? So the investigation phase is a very interesting phase of truth because it's during the investigation phase that we have a more open mind and we also have a more open emotional set. We have a more open feelings. Right? And as a result of that, we're able to investigate new truth. When you think about it, this is the part where we all need to get about any truth. Because this is a sort of a scientific process. Right? It's a process that every single person on the planet can engage. We have an intellect to engage it. It's a process where we can investigate truth. We can find out whether something is true or not through a process of deduction and also a process of experience does that make sense and it's this scientific process of investigation that i would love to encourage the whole world to be involved in with regard to the truths that are being presented to them through this divine truth stuff that myself and mary are talking about now unfortunately because nobody wants to do this because there is this and this in terms of emotionally ahead uh, first there's this tendency for people to go into ridicule and the people to go into anger before they get to the point of investigation. When enough people decide to not do these things anymore and just to do that, without making a decision, you don't need to make decisions when you investigate, all you need to do is investigate truthfully. Right? I find it quite ironic in the media last week how both uh, channel Seven and Channel Nine are both saying they have an investigation about this cult leader who claims he's Jesus. Their, their investigation is just a whole presentation of lies and innuendo. Right? If they played their entire tape even, there is actual a correction. If they played what they had actually recorded themselves, there is a complete correction of most of the things they're presenting in what they've actually recorded. So, for example, like a current affair did a 12 minute interview with me around about that 12 minute interview. If they played the entire 12 minute interview, they would realize that 
that I've answered every single question about whether there's any need to, for anybody to worry, whether there's any need to be worried about me, you know, in terms of, you know, what my passions and desires are and wh how, whether I do want to take over the world or not and all those kind of things. And, and they, would, they would have all the answers, but they don't want the answers, nor do they want you to have the answers. What they want to do is to present what they feel is true to you, which is that this Jesus guy is an idiot. That's what they want you to know, that he's an idiot. And so what they will do is they, they get a tiny little bit of what I've said about totally out of context. And sometimes, like I'm a bit of a jokester generally, and so, so in presentations I'll be laughing about other things and, and hamming it up a bit sometimes. And they'll get that and present that as if that's true. As if, uh, but if you re read or listen to the entire presentation, it's something totally different. And in fact, most people who do this find that everything I present is very logical, in fact. Not only logical, but it also appeals to the heart for some reason. But most people don't want to go to that point because this is preferable. Because in these two conditions, what you can do is you can enjoy the attack of another person without having any personal confrontation of your own life. That's what you can do. So in these two places, while you're ridiculing another or while you're getting angry with another, you can enjoy the process of what that makes you feel inside, nice and powerful and controlled of your life. You can enjoy the process of actually doing that inside of yourself so much that you then don't have to face anything. You don't have to make personal choices and decisions. You, you, you can just blame other people for what they're saying or, or doing. Whereas when you get to this point where you actually engage a scientific process of investigation, now in that moment you have now changed from being just this emotional person dictated to by all this avoidance inside of ourselves into a person who's now quite logically processing through is this true or not now at least with doing this you have some way of determining truth when you do this there is no way of you ever determining the truth now the media in particular but also most people when you think about it are focused on this you think in in your own lives even whenever you've had a thought that disagreed with your mates one of the first things that happens is what? Oh, yeah, sure, you know, we'll just ridicule the guy. And if he can handle the ridicule um, enough, then we might listen to him. That's almost an Australian way, isn't it? Like, if you can handle the ribbing, then by the time you've got through that, then there might be a good chance that we can listen to you. And we've just, we're addicted to that as a society, just the ridicule first. So uh, on uh, yesterday, uh, I had an interview for five minutes. I don't even think it was five minutes, probably like three minutes or two. It might have been five minutes. Mary got to say a few things. Um, and I couldn't stop laughing, to be honest, uh, because it was just so humorous that um, they were just trying to sen sensationalise that I'm saying that I'm Jesus without listening to a single other thing. And, and, and I couldn't stop laughing because I could feel the intention of the person. And, and I, I was sort of more like tongue-tied than Mary was. Mary was quite like, as she normally is, quite, you know... She, when, when Mary is in a space where she feels like... Uh, um, connected, like she is much more uh, probably literate than I am. I should probably say, but uh, for myself, it was just I, I, I was just so I thought it was so funny. And the reason why I think it's funny is because I can see the process that we're going to have to go through here is the same process that every other person who's ever presented truth on the planet had to go through, and that is they had to first get ridiculed for, by a lot of people, and eventually a lot of people got angry with them. And then eventually, at some point, some people started to investigate. Right? So I feel that the investigation... And then the fourth thing, if it happens, is acceptance. And, but acceptance is never going to happen without an investigation. True acceptance. So any person who says to you, like, any time a person comes up to me and says, oh, I believe you're Jesus, and I say, uh, have you heard anything I've said? 
to, you know, have you listened to any of it? Oh, uh, no, no, I just believe you did. And I'm going, sorry, but you've not yet done an investigation. It's impossible for you to believe that I'm Jesus if you haven't done an investigation. Totally impossible. Like, how can you ever do that? That's totally illogical, right? I agree that you might be being told by a spirit that, that I'm Jesus, and fair enough. You know, there are many spirits, well, all of the celestial spirits know who I am, and there are now many spirits in the lower dimensions in the spirit world who know, know who I am and know who Mary is and know who the others are of the 14. But, but for you to personally accept it, it's not a matter of just being told it. Like, and, and what I find quite remarkable is this presentation by the media at times that, you know, everyone who comes along to a session like this is gullible. Like, that's not what I've found. I've found that everyone who comes to a session like this is very questioning, very, like, you know, just me saying I'm Jesus puts warning bells in everybody's mind generally. And so now they are more questioning than they'd ever be with any other thing, generally. And that's exactly what I expect. Of course I expect that. Whereas, whereas they just, they're, what they're doing is they're judging me through their previous experience of so-called cult leaders. And their previous experience has been, the cult leader says everything I'm saying is true. The cult leader says you've got to do what I'm saying is true. The cult leader says I'm going to control your life and that's fine. You should give over control to me. And the cult leader says all those things. That's not what I feel. What I feel is completely different than that. What I feel is I would love you to engage control of your own life properly. I would love to, you to investigate things for yourself properly. I would love you to, you know, to connect with God by yourself without you feeling that you need a mediator. These are all the things that I've presented historically and I'll present them all again at some point. But my feelings are that for the majority of people, they will need to go through this process. Now... My feelings also are that the first people who get to this point are going to benefit the most. Because if it is true, if what I'm saying is true, then it's going to have a large impact not only on your life but also on the world and also on other things in the long run, if it is true. And so if you get to the point where you can at least investigate it with an open mind, you are going to benefit more than any other person. The people who want to stay in ridicule for the rest of their life are not going to benefit much at all. And the people who want to stay angry are not going to benefit much at all. You imagine, you imagine the Wright brothers get up there, they fly their first plane, <laughs> right? 16 seconds later, not a very long flight, or whatever it is, I might, might have even been shorter than that, they land their plane and they've just demonstrated to the world that you can fly through powered flight. And you stood there watching it and you go, no, nah, that never happened. <laughs> I'm definitely going to stay angry with those fellas. You know, they're idiots in ridicule. Or you might be angry with them. You know, they just, you know, I didn't get there first. <laughs> so I want to be angry with you because you didn't, because you got there first. And so they get angry with them. And can you imagine today there's this old man, if he survived this long, he'd be in his hundreds by now, sitting there going, I'm still angry with the Wright brothers. <laughs> you know, and when, when he gets to see his uh, children who now live overseas in England, I can't go overseas, there's no such thing as flight. You know, like, now that, that is the extreme, but that's what happens. Unfortunately, with anger, Some, see, sometimes with anger, even if, it's, even if it's presented, the truth is presented, bare face truth presented to us, we still want to remain in a position of anger and fear. And whereas if we get to the investigation and we investigate everything, and then we realise that actually there's a lot of truth here, and we actually come to see it and experience it for ourselves, now it's very, very difficult for for us to not go into the next stage, which is the acceptance stage. Does that make sense? Now, now because people are in these two areas, myself and Mary's life at times gets quite difficult because um, we get a lot of... Um, in particular myself, Mary sort of gets more ridiculed than anger, anger generally. The ridicule that's aimed at Mary for, uh, most of the time is she's just a silly little girl who, who, has, is, who has no like, reasoning capacity, who's just in love with this guy that she doesn't know. Right? 
That's, and, and they treat her as if she's some kind of bimbo. Um, and, and sometimes I, I feel like encouraging Mary to, bl to blonde her hair just to, just to go along with the act. But, <laughs> but I, I like brunette, to, <laughs> her brunette. But, but the, so, if, so Mary receives a lot of that kind of treatment you know so she's an intelligent universally educated woman who just gets a lot of treatment even from her own family that she's just being an idiot that is manipulated by me in some way um, for me I'm usually the one who gets a bit more of that the the rage and the anger so so I get sworn at a lot and condemned a lot and so forth and so for me there's quite a lot of emotions that that I work through as a result of all of those things. Now I'm getting to the stage where I'm almost over those emotions, which means when somebody swears at me, I go, no worries, just swear away, man. <laughs> like, you need your anger, because you, you're never going to get to investigate yet until you have it, right? So, so, so for me now, there's this feeling of um, wanting to help people get through these phases and into a place where they at least have an open-minded investigation. Emotionally, it's been quite difficult for me to do that, like to get to the point where you now can cope with people's injustice, you can cope with people laughing at you publicly. You know, now, um, one of Mary's greatest fears is that we're just walking into an airport or whatever and everyone just laughs at us, you know? Like, um, you know, I had two cleaners where we stayed at a motel laughing at me the other morning. <laughs> Um, you know, that's, you just get, you, so you get this barrage of people laughing at you and, uh, and if, you, if you don't let yourself work your way through that emotionally, at the end of the day you get quite angry. Right? So we've had to work our way through lots of emotions relating to this process that is happening around us, if you like. So um, for me, that's happening, been happening for seven years. I've been travelling around the world. Uh, saying that I'm Jesus for that amount of time. Now, when I say travelling around the world, I've only been going to places where people invite me to go. So, so I haven't. I, we have. We don't advertise anything. We don't market anything. Nobody has heard about us until the media put us there. Interestingly enough, one of the comments on the media is they're on a marketing drive to recruit more. <laughs> what do they call them? Followers. followers that's right. Followers. <laughs> Disciples or followers, that's right. Uh, like the cult leaders on a marketing drive. It's, it's uh, so amusing because actually we came to Melbourne because Anto and Jane actually invited us to come to Melbourne. And we went to Albury because we have some people we met in Albury that invited us to go to Albury. And we're going, we went to Mildura because we had another group of people there who found out about us somehow. We don't know how people find out. Um, uh, everything's given away for free, so eventually, you know, one person hands a DVD to the other person and so forth, and eventually somebody finds it. And we then um, went to Mildura for the same reason. Um, next week, or next month, uh, two weeks' time or so, so we're going to Greece. And uh, interesting comment from the media global it's a global summit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just, and I just laugh. You've got to get a laugh about these things. Um, Global Summit, yeah, yeah. A group of about eight people who we know, <laughs> who we know in Greece, <laughs> invi invited us to go to Greece to to speak with them. And in the end, there might finish up being like eighty or ninety people there, but most of whom we've, we we don't know. But there's quite a number of them we do know who we've met all over the go, by going all over the world in the last seven years. So that becomes a global summit. My and Mary's one bedroom home becomes the headquarters. <laughs> And I'm meant to have called them the headquarters, by the way. Um, uh, and so that just... And then, and then Channel 7 gets a whole heap of television cameras, puts them in an audience of 150 people. And they asked me, and I said, yeah, no worries. You know, I don't stop anybody from doing anything. So we had, I had a camera on this side of me, looking down at the audience. I had a camera over the back there. And what does Channel 7 say in their Today Tonight show? Our hidden cameras capture... 150 people saw these hidden cameras capturing these things. Um, and uh, I, to be frank, like what, I, what that causes me to ponder 
is just how much we trust the media to be telling the truth when the reality is that most of the time they must be lying through their pants, to be frank. Like, because that's all been my experience this week. <laughs> you know, just lie upon lie upon lie upon lie, you know? Interesting thing happened at our, see, at our home, um, we found that the sugar gliders were sometimes gliding into, when we bought the property, the sugar gliders, there's a lot of sugar gliders there and there's more and more coming. And we found they flew into the fences, the barbed wire fences, and we had to unravel them. So I got all my fences taken down. Right, And then um, down at this land that, by the way, I don't own any land other than 40 acres that myself and Mary live on that I bought in 2007, before I even received a f my first donation, I bought this land and, uh, and, I ha and I bought the land, Mary wasn't with me then, I bought this land specifically because I felt Mary would be with me soon and I thought it would be a lovely location for us to work through our stuff without getting bothered too much. Um, and it might not prove to be very true. <laughs> and it was out in the bush, you know, 40 k's away from the main town, which is Kingaroy, and um, we both, both love the bush a lot. And, uh, and, so, and so we bought this property out in the bush and uh, and we thought that, that would be a nice little sort of like a retreat you know where we could go and get some privacy yeah and anyway might not be happening soon but what I find very interesting is we had this same Channel 7 crew we had them stay in our home for two days myself and Mary cooked for them and cleaned up after them for two days actually um, and we just allowed them to see our life. Now, they, from that, are comparing me with David Koresh, which in the USA had a compound with gates and walls <laughs> around it with machine guns inside. Right? Interesting. That's what I'd call pretty high manipulation, wouldn't you? Yeah. Now... This is all like, do they want any investigation? No, because they personally investigated, found nothing at all to worry about, but, but there's a media frenzy. So we've got to do something. So what we do is we create all this false stuff, one after the other after the other. And, and I just, like, when myself and Mary, we were going there, like, the, the piece of land that I mentioned just earlier, that four other people own that we know, <laughs> Like we know them and they do have an intention that they would like to donate it to the God's Way of Love organisation if that organisation ever gets set up now because of the amount of, like, the amount of attack the tax office has received about all this false information that is not true. We're trying to set up a charity, for goodness sake, right? A non-profit charity, which who knows whether it's going to happen now because of all of these so false accusations. But... We're trying to set up this non-profit charity and there's a group of four people who own this land and they would like to donate it to that charity. Right? That's, that's, this, that's the history. They haven't donated it to the charity yet. They would like to. And, uh, and we can't have that donation occur until the charity is set up, of course. So, so we're waiting for the tax office to set it up. Now, in that process as well, I've been investigated now with the ATA because I've had people saying he's receiving donations that he doesn't declare. <coughs> now, the truth is that we actually do declare it all, and I do a tax return every year, just like you guys do, and all of that happens just normally as well. But, you know, of course, all these people have all these false accusations, and they want them to be true, <coughs> right? And you know what the underlying problem is, I feel? Nobody on the planet believes in the goodness of anybody else anymore. They just don't believe somebody can be actually truthful and good. They just don't. They believe there's got to be uh, some ulterior motive. Myself and Mary do everything for free by donation. You see the donation box at the back there. You it see it's a bit beaten up, mostly because it travels with us, but also because that's how we received it when the first person who, <laughs> who gave us the box gave us the box with the signs on it. It's exactly the same as it's been since then. Um, what happens is myself and Mary receive donations so, and so you don't have to donate when you walk out of here and by the way if you do wish to take any of the DVDs there there's a pack of 14 DVDs 
please feel free to take them. You do not have to donate for them at all. Does that make sense? But there is a little bo red box next to them saying donations for DVDs. We do everything we provide for free. I had a minister accuse me of ulterior motives. I find this very interesting, considering that a minister is generally paid by the church for getting up on his pulpit and talking. And yet he, who is getting paid a wage, is saying that I, who actually all I have is sitting out the back there a donation box, is actually being manipulative. Right? I'm sorry? And given how, yeah, of course, they're given housing and everything else. They don't provide any of that, right? They get a church all built for them. <laughs> um, whereas for, for ourselves, what we do is we just do these in halls or whatever and different people. Usually it's ourselves, but in case of here in Melbourne, Anto and Jane have paid for this venue uh, for you. You know, that's their gift to you. Everything is done voluntary uh, for free. And yet I find there's no trust of that. Nobody even trusts that. Oh, he's got to have some ulterior motive. Like, you know, everything you do for free and you've still got some ulterior motive. What's that? And then, uh, you know, during my discussions with people, and Mary as well when we get up and discuss with people, we talk a lot about free will. And in fact, we spend most of our life discussing with people how their free will is being contravened. Right? In other words, how people or in their life are already controlling their free will. We don't want to control people's free will. In fact, everything we speak of is about actually helping people to engage their own free will and take total personal responsibility for their own life. Right? Ironically, exactly the opposite presentation in the media. Now, any person who investigates will actually find... Um, how many YouTube presentations are there uploaded now, Igor? Like, By the way, Igor, who's sitting there doing our sound, has also uploaded all the presentations for free. Right? He hasn't even asked for a payment from me. Sometimes I donate to Igor and, and, and give him funds because I feel he's doing a fantastic thing. But uh, you've uploaded now probably close to 30 YouTube presentations. On the internet, on our free website, of which there's no membership, and, there, and, and we have a lot of trouble with maintaining any email list, so I don't know whether it's worth actually going on our email list even. Um, on there you'll find links to MP3 recordings of every single talk that I've given from 2007. Uh, there is literally, I think, 400 hours of MP3 on that discussing. If you want to find out about my life and Mary's life and other people's lives associated with us and you want to find out about the things that we're presenting, the truth about all of them, you'll find them all in that. There's 400 hours of it, all available for free. There's no closed doors. And what did they call this piece of land that um, that these other four people, by the way, own, not, not myself and Mary, we, we don't have any control over the land aside from giving advice to the people who own it. And what, what do they call that? They call it the compound. Beachfront <laughs> Sorry, what was that one? Beachfront paradise. Beachfront paradise. Beachfront paradise. Beachfront paradise. Beachfront paradise. Is that what they yeah, said? saying it's going to be a beachfront paradise. Oh, okay, beachfront paradise. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to be possible considering that it's facing west anyway. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, so this is all, you know. And then uh, this uh, guy from 2GB says, but you're predicting the end of the world, aren't you? No, sorry, we aren't. We're actually predicting that the world is going to go through some cataclysmic changes, firstly, economically, well, firstly, probably politically, secondly, economically, and then thirdly, there will be upheaval on the earth itself through a process over the, over the next few years. But after that, things are going to be pretty good, actually, is what we're saying, but they don't want to hear that either, right? So, so why is that? Because they want it to be some kind of doomsday cult. You see, you see, the way cults have uh, operated in the past is that they've always had some kind of doomsday event that then causes people to have to, you know, connect with uh, that doomsday event. Does that make sense? Me, can, can we just... 
can we just use the mic, but you don't have to worry about... I know, it doesn't matter. No, you have said today that today was the end of the world. Can you say it again in the mic, because you'll never hear it. They've said on the media that today was the end of the world. Yep, yeah, and um, we were asked that question actually yesterday. We thought, what a way to go with Jesus yeah. and Mary. <laughs> We said if we're going to go, we might as well go with Jesus and Mary. <laughs> if I was asked what I would do if I felt it was my last day, I, I would say, oh, I'm going to do exactly what I'm already doing. <laughs> but yeah, um, there is a whole... There is a lot of cults uh, um, who believe in specific dates. The irony is that uh, many of these predictions are based from spirits who are telling them things but the people on earth are not understanding what they're telling them. The truth is Jesus is on earth at the moment but of course not many people want to know that and, uh, and therefore and not many want to, people see, want to see it as, it as it truly is. And so yeah that's the way, that's the way it goes. You had a question? Uh, can we wait for the mic there? Um, something you said a few minutes ago about mm -hmm. um, people can't believe this can be true and I think like when I got presented with your DVDs I said to the woman who suggested it I said oh you can't be serious you know <laughs> yeah. and but thank god I must have some divine spirits around me because it took me about 10 minutes to think holy shit <laughs> I'm, this this sounds like the truth to me yeah but then I had to think, oh, if I go out into the world and say, I believe this is Jesus, I'm going to sound like a Jehovah's Witness. Well, you're not only going to sound like that, you're going to sound pretty crazy yourself, yeah, aren't you? Yeah, and I thought everyone around me who's been expecting it is going to think, right, she's, now she's finally tipped over the edge. Yeah. But then the big block for me has been, well, how did I get to meet Jesus? How did... So sort of feelings of unworthiness... Well, I think Almost. a lot of people probably feel like, oh, my God, well, you know, out of all the billions of people on the planet, yep. I got exposed to this truth. And and how did that happen for me? And how, look, oh, my God, I hugged Jesus today. And I think, well... There's nothing special about hugging Jesus. Well, there is. No, there isn't, like... <laughs> <laughs> there isn't, though, like, like, I feel just as blessed to hug you as you would to hug me and I, and I don't feel there's anything special about hugging Jesus at all yeah and in fact I feel quite embarrassed that you feel <laughs> that there is actually and um, my feelings though if you want to know exactly how it happened ever I can tell you for yourself how it happened and um, there is a combination of factors firstly there is the your own desire for truth you're like you've had a pretty hard life um, particularly related to both parents and as such you've had this sort of inbuilt feeling of wanting to discover truth to, to have some happiness then on top of that you do have some guides who know who I am and know uh, the truth as well about life and so they then they then impact upon you and your decisions and and they try to influence the people around you to give you things that will benefit you and then thirdly um, your desire to to become more real in your life is quite strong even though you've got some resistance to that and those passionate desires you have really make you a person who's in this mode here <coughs> who's willing to go through a process of investigation. Now, I love people who are willing to go through a process of investigation because that's the type of person I am. Like, I, I love going through processes of investigation of new truth. That's how I've discovered in my own personal life the truths that I've discovered through this same process of investigation that I'm encouraging you to follow. So, so um, I feel the kind of people that I love a lot and the reason why you got a hug from me today is because you're that kind of person who, wa who, who wants to at least go through an investigation. Now, t to me, that's quite unique. Um, on the planet, there are huge amounts of people who don't want to go through investigations, who just would rather believe the ridicule or get angry. However, I actually do believe on the planet today that there are now becoming more and more huge amounts of people who will not take things 
at face value anymore. They won't take the politics at face value. They won't take the economics at face value. They won't take the media at face value anymore. What they want to do is they want to know more about it. We're getting to be a group of people on the planet who are far more interested in finding the real truth about things than, than putting up with this constant barrage of, well, what I feel is just constant barrage of crap most of the time coming at us. Yeah, and so so I feel the reason why you've discovered the truth or you've met Jesus <laughs> is because uh, you have exactly the same kind of attitude that Jesus has. And to be frank, if you had the same kind of attitude that David Koresh have, you probably would have met David Koresh, right? Which is a, not a person that I would really like to spend too much time with personally. But uh, aside from maybe helping him get over why he wants to be involved in fighting the USA government, does that make sense? Like, so, so to my, in my mind, the people who are in this place, this place of investigation, are the people with a really strong desire to know truth and they're willing even and you know for yourself you, you know you came up to me before the session today saying how afraid you were of all of this media attention and, and so forth and how that's affecting yourself with your dad and how your dad wants to kill me and all those kind of things and and that's how much fear has been perpetrated upon you in your life about the discovery of truth. Now I'm really freaking out because that's going to be on YouTube. Oh God. <laughs> Please don't put that on YouTube. Well, so now you want to you not tell the truth. Is that how it is? Or? Um, well, I have told the truth, but... It's safe environment. Well, th this is the aspect that you both as sisters is uh, from an emotional perspective need to address there is no such thing as a safe environment on the planet today there is no such thing as a safe environment i wish i hadn't said anything now well, would you like us to cut this piece out would you I don't know. will you let me know later but but my feelings are i have had hundreds of people threaten my life already Right? in this life you know I've had people ring me up because they've heard that their daughter went along to one session and they've rang me up saying they'll murder me if their daughter sees me again now, what control did I have over a person walking in the door and yet they ring me up saying they'll murder me like that's how much control there is in families so much control that they're willing to murder a person who somebody their family has met through an accidental what or what appears to be an accidental I interaction the, the truth is that the majority of people who are in a rage are protecting their own investments in you the media has an investment in you do you know what that investment's called it's called advertising that's their investment in you. You see, without their creating a sensation, they would not get... They, they're competing for advertising dollars. That's their primary motive. Without, uh, without actually creating a sensation, many of them would have to present the same information. They don't get an edge like that. They don't get their advertising dollars like that. So what do they do? They create a completely fictitious story in many cases in order to get their advertising dollars to, because their advertising dollars are all based upon you. Whether you visit that site or whether you listen to that show or not every night. That's what it's all based on. So, so my feelings are that every single person with an investment is going to be confronted when they meet Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't have those investments, right? And so my feeling is, and Mary's feeling is too, actually, that once we focus on truth, no matter what, we will no longer be invested in how people perceive this truth, nor will we even invested in our own safety. And when we get to the point where we're no longer invested in our own safety, then we'll have dealt with fear. And my feelings for you girls are you've had a terribly fearful life perpetrated by parents upon you 
And as a result of that, you need to deal with that fearful life, the fears you have. The way people manipulate you is through your fear, not through any other thing. They can't manipulate you if they really love you. You see, you think about it with your own children. Do you want to control them if you love them? See, a lot of parents go, no, no, I can see them making a mistake. I can see they're going to make a mistake. Now, if you love your child, wouldn't you allow your child to make a mistake? If you now have to browbeat them, abuse them, control them and manipulate them so they don't make a mistake, I feel you're making a much bigger mistake. You'd be better off letting them make the mistake and learn through that experience if they don't listen to you just from a chat, you know? But the problem is on the planet is that we have so many rigid controls upon us. That we have learnt to become a controlled society because, they, because you see, initially, the, 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 what do you call it? the justification for it is that if we didn't have a controlled society, then everything would be lawless. Well, now, I put to you that if we, the only way to have a safe society is to have a loving society. Not by laws, but actually people feel love. You know, how effective are laws to create love? There are literally thousands of family laws and yet every single day on the news you find even murders of family members murdering family members. So the law didn't stop them from doing it. The only thing that's going to stop them from doing it is love. That's the only thing that's going to stop them from doing it. Yeah. Hey, just quickly, um, in what you're saying about you know truth and you know the anger and the ridicule, process, I've, I've had yeah. a little bit of that happen to me this week. Yeah, yeah. And You've um, had a fair bit happen to you this yeah, week, yeah, my friend. And, and like I've had a bit of emotions of you know rejection <coughs> and all that kind of stuff come up and fear. Yep. But at the same time, as that's happening, I've had a sense of uh, like liberation that I'm actually free to to be what I what I want to be and engaging in what I love doing more so yep. I'm actually finding love for myself and for people around me only because I know now that deep down my soul is bigger than what I've created myself to be now yep. like I have bigger purpose in the world and in myself only because I've actually confronted a bit of that fear yep. And the irony is that when we confront our fear for the first time, I mean fully confront it and feel it, and I've seen you feeling some of it this week. Um, so when you're fully confronted and feel it, for the first time in your life you feel liberated. You see, before then, your fear dictates your life. So, so we spend a lot of our life preventing this and preventing that and preventing this and preventing that. You know? The whole insurance industry is actually all about preventing this, preventing that, preventing... You, know, like you think of a lot of industries today, the legal profession, the, a lot of the um, medical profession. A lot of, you know, the pharmaceutical companies and industries. A lot of it is all about prevention, prevention of fear. Myself and Mary were watching the other day. We don't get to see TV very much. And uh, so, because we don't have one at home or anything. And we were watching the other day when we were on the road, a, a movie. And in the movie, every, you know, every ad break, there was this germ, this germs, you've got to worry about these germs and it kills 99.9% .9 of germs. And I, just, I said to Mary, yeah, what about the 1.1% that kill you, you know, like, and, and the fact is that, you know, your body is full of germs at any point in time. So, you know, you, why do you want to kill 99% of them in your external environment when your whole body is just <laughs> full of germs that are getting, you know, looked after every day. But, but the fear is so great and the marketing even is based around the fear. You look at the marketing for a new car, a lot of it is based around, oh, you've got to look good. What's that? A fear of looking bad. You know? um, so, so when you actually let yourself work your way through your fear, all of a sudden you feel free, like freedom, a feeling of liberation. Yeah, ironically. Being in that truth with yourself, regardless of God's truth or not, just being in truth with that makes the fear really come up. And then, well, that's just what it is. You know? And then when you feel it, it goes away from you and then you don't feel it. And, and in fact, uh, th the first time I felt myself a feeling where I didn't have as much fear was when I come face to face with death. 
all right? When you become face to face with death, which I've done in this life, um, and realize that there's nothing like that can happen to me now, I could die friendless, like familyless, friendless, and partnerless, and penniless, and all those kind of things. Um, and that's the worst possible situation that could happen. And when you get to that point, you go, well, actually, isn't that very liberating? Because, because they, I've just experienced the worst possible thing that could ever happen. So, so how, how, it can't get any bad, worse than this. It can't get any, any more difficult to face. And in that moment, ironically, for the first time, you start feeling a sense of liberation and freedom. Yeah. And I feel a lot of people need to, to get to that place. You know, if we, if we as a society got to that place, we would be uh, unable to be manipulated as a society. No politician could ever manipulate us. <laughs> you know, no public official could ever manipulate us. No media outlet could ever manipulate us. Just no advertisement would ever manipulate <laughs> us. You wouldn't go and buy... Um, well, yeah, whatever the <laughs> product is that wants to kill 99.9% of the germs, um, you wouldn't go and buy that product because, because fear doesn't drive your life. And, and you save lots of money when fear doesn't drive your life as well. And you save a lot of your time, ironically. Because you see, a lot of our day is invested in other people's opinion of us, if you think about it. That's what happens if we have a mic over... Yeah. You do need a mic because I want to record your voice. This is what I'm saying. I, want to have my voice. I, I do want to have your voice. Oh no, you don't. That's, <laughs> yes, a, I do. that's another question. I'm well, the problem the problem is, is when we make a recording of these, if people can't hear your comment or your question, then they don't know what I'm answering. I know. I mean, I have my life that my voice is always loud. <laughs> ah, yes. No worries. Well, that's an emotion. Oh. Okay. <laughs> do you feel you can't be heard unless you're loud? <laughs> Yeah, that hit the nail Touché on the... with that one, yeah. <laughs> go ahead. I know you made me all bashful. <laughs> now I have to change my voice. There you go. Um, now you've forgotten. You've taken Sorry. me off there. Oh, that's always been my... Um, but that's what I can't believe, that love, peace and joy, like doesn't matter what religion you are, yep. they can't get it right because they sh it's all poor God, whatever you want to perceive him to be, just wants love, peace and joy. Yeah. Um, what's your... Um, what can I say? I don't know how to put it. Um, What's my take? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, a few years ago, I went to, like, they've given you such a hard time. Like, that's where I didn't tell my family to say where I was going because no I had a kundalini and in that, yeah. I was Mary. So I thought, oh, well, if I, they would just say something, I could say, well, I've come to see my son. Yeah. <laughs> I could use that. <laughs> but um, what's your view on kundaliniums and things like that on well I went to a what's um, the word you used it's called a kundalini not kundalini or yeah, it might be that way kundalini kundalini energy or? I went to yeah I went to a um, what would you call it I better not mention the name if you listen to the presentation that will be put on YouTube in a few days time of the presentation I did in in Mildura I answered the question. On that? Hmm. Oh, there you go. There you go. Oh. In fact, you'll find that most people's questions I've answered before at some point. Yeah, because in 400 hours you get to answer a lot of questions. <laughs> you know, yeah. But that's where, like, you know, a lot of the people that do these big expos, like, I won't mention names, but um, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble because it's, like they have like 600 people at these conferences and that, yeah. that people who aren't really, you can just be open to anything that you can get yeah. yourself into a lot of trouble. You can. And the truth is there are a lot of charlatans and there are a lot of people that have manipulated us in the past and there are a lot of people that have taken our money in the past and that's why we believe when Jesus comes along that he's going to do the same thing. That's the truth. The truth is that if he's really Jesus, he's not going to do the same thing. But we're going to believe it before we even investigate my my feelings about love though in particular i'd like to discuss with you all in more detail in fact what we'd like to probably do if we're finished with this subject what i'd like to do maybe is have a break there's there's free cup of tea <laughs> about that. and and if you take one of those 
you, I'm going to demand of you. <laughs> no, no. It, it's all for free. And um, some people have brought along some snacks as well. So uh, that's available up there. For those of you who would like to take a set of DVDs, take the whole set. Don't be shy. It's OK. Um, take the whole set that I've been given uh, there for you to take. And what we'll do after the break is we'll talk about how the world sees love in comparison to what love really is. How does that sound? Yep. So we'll talk about that. All right, let's have a break for a little bit. How's everyone doing? <laughs> All fed and watered? Yep. And relieved? <laughs> fed, watered and relieved. Okay. Well, we wanted to have a chat with you about, about how the world sees love rather than how God sees love. So it's a bit, bit of a different take on, on love than what we've had in the past. Are we... Uh, yep, now, yeah. And we're all recording, aren't we? Yep. Should... Do you want to compare the oh, two? Actually, no, I made a promise before the uh, break. Would you like to... Uh, um, if you just turn on the mic for... If you can just say to people what, your name, what your name is. Yep. So what yeah. was your name? My name is Blas. Plus. Nice to meet you, yeah. Same guys. Yes, I would like to make a comment through uh, the process that you were writing about. The process uh, of ridicule, then yeah. anger, yeah. then investigation. And then, if I got time, I would like to ask a question. Sure. Yep. Uh, I would like to apologize because English is not my, you know, my language. Not your first language. It's Spanish. You're yeah. doing very well, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I would like to, to try to explain myself as best as I can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think for me it has been very relevant those stages that you have put. Mm -hmm. You know, in some way because I have done all of them, you know? So you've gone through the ridicule, yeah. then the anger. Yeah, but I have practiced that. I have ridicule, I've been angry, and now I'm in the third stage. So I don't know if I will get to the fourth stage. You know? <laughs> yeah. But I can put you an example. You know, my partner, Joel, um, found, found out about you, I would say, two years ago, or yep. one year and a half. She has listened to 400 hours of <laughs> MP3. You poor man. Just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I used to say, oh, the bloody AJ, always in the background, <laughs> fed up. Always with the emotion, with whatever. So, fed yeah. ridiculing, or fed up with AJ, so you don't get tired of listening all day, AJ. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Then I went through the angry. Uh, last year, when you came to Melbourne, to Cranbourne, uh, in that yep, farm in, in, yep. in May then. Yeah, yep. in May. Yep. Okay, we went to see you there. Yep. And I was really at the end of the seven hours, because there was a seven hours. It was a very long That's day. right, we spoke for seven yeah, hours. Seven yeah. hours. <laughs> I was really, really angry, yep. simply saying, you know, how this guy can say that it's Jesus or not? Okay. I come from a Catholic country. My parents never were very religious, okay? But when I was 17, I don't know, I decided to look for truth, yep. you know? Yep. And in that way, in all these years, uh, I have learned, or at least to trust, you know? What is feel right, I do it. What it doesn't feel right, So you've been you know? trusting your feelings Yeah, trusting truth. my feelings, you know? Yep. So it doesn't mean that I believe that you're Jesus. Of course. Not, no. you know? yep. But it's good. I got very angry the other day when I watched on TV, you know, the way that you were treated. Yeah. Simply because I, th I, th I thought, this is Australia. Everybody should have a fair go. This guy is not having a fair go. Yep. You know? and, no, but that stage of anger, the usual I was angry with her because she was you know, <laughs> believing what you say. I was criticizing how can be this true or not. Then after a few days, you know, that anger went out and I decided, okay, I will give it a try. I was working in, you know, like repairing cars. So it's, it's a very repetitive job that you don't have even to pay attention. So yeah. I was with my iPod listening. Yeah. And then I had the saying, oh, what is all this bloody emotion and feeling? How do you feel that stuff or not? So at the end, even for people, I don't know, who has arrived here or not, just want to explain that even if I don't know sure. I'm not sure yet if you're Jesus or not. Yeah. Because for me, Jesus was very important, not for a religious thing, just because I liked the way he was. Even I got tattooed Jesus in my arm. So that a guy said that this Jesus always bothered you a little bit. Yeah. But the thing is, why people get angry with the thing that you say? You know, from my point of view, okay, there are people that they have been raised 
Catholic or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I guess for me, um, even from some people that we consider ourselves spiritual, you know, probably the most difficult thing is to have to change belief that we had. Okay. For me, it was very hard just mm -hmm. not to believe that reincarnation exists. Because, OK, you got the past life. You've been with this person for this. You know, believing in reincarnation and in past life, many things make sense to you. Yes, or not? I yeah. agree. So <coughs> or it, seem to make sense. It, yeah. or it seems to make sense. Mm. Even, even now, I'm not sure. Because you say, OK, when somebody, you know, we know a very famous medium. It's called Claire East. Mm -hmm. I have had a, like a past life uh, reading. And everything that you said, made your much sense to me, mm -hmm. felt right. Mm -hmm. Now I got I hesitate because I may think what you say that this spirit influences mm -hmm. or it may be the past life. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure yet. I'm investigating mm -hmm. and being open. Mm -hmm. So uh, so this is the process that I've been going through. I'm in the investigating or whatever research and time. So I can say for everybody that is new here I don't believe that yet that you're Jesus or not, but many of the things that you say make sense. Yeah. I can be using in my life to improve my life, yeah. and I don't have to take everything that you say, because I'm going through. You know, for me, all this emotion and stuff is a little bit It's hard. pretty hard. It's a little bit hard. Yeah. And that is one of the questions that I would like to ask and give sure. you an example, another sure. example. But just to, I don't know, just to show to everybody or even the people that are new to him and not, and they're not here just, you know, that you're Jesus or whoever, that even if you know Jesus, you know, for me it doesn't matter. Yeah. Simply because I can use whatever thing is right for me, whatever the thing that you say, uh, that I can see that they're useful in my life and I can mm. improve my life, and, you know, better me, make me a better human being. Mm. Okay. I have to go through many things, of course, but I'm yeah. a human being, so... Yeah. I feel uh, for most people, they either want things to be right or wrong. They don't want there to be a slowly developing and unfolding truth. They, they want to be able to decide right here and now, is this right or is this wrong? And, and one of the things I've learned in my own progression towards God is that if you can accept that it's a slowly developing and unfolding truth that eventually becomes through personal experience. The only way that in the end you will ever know truth is by personally experiencing that truth. Uh, if you allow that process to continue, you will come to know all truth. But because a lot of people want to know right now, right or wrong, they don't understand that the unfolding of truth is the way in which we learn truth. And in that process, because they don't understand, they're making often a choice on the, on the side of error because they just don't want to go through the process of a slow unfolding of truth. And, uh, and I feel that's one of the main problems on the planet. We, many of us have this from an emotional injury from our childhood, ironically, because in, in our childhood, when we got things wrong, it was very frequently associated with punishment. So, yeah, so for example, if, if I if I made a choice or a decision that was wrong when I was a child and it was in disagreement or disharmony with my parent, the parent would often at least get angry with me and, and sometimes even carry it right the way through into violence towards me. And what that does is it creates in me then this, this, this feeling that I'm not allowed to get anything wrong again, otherwise I'm going to get hurt. And so, and the problem is, is that investigation of truth means you've got to investigate between things you know you've got to investigate things and it is a slow unfolding so if if you're addicted to having solid truth given to you just there and then and you're not prepared to go through the unfolding of truth then it's going to be very very hard for you to actually learn truth so that's what i feel is happening for many people on the planet where they have got this learned thing learned response from our parents that unless we get it right right now we're, we're not allowed to make a mistake if we make a mistake we're going to get punished and so it, it, so so when somebody comes along to a session like this for example and then they tell their friends oh i went along and this guy said he's what what why did you go along there you know you straight away the punishment 
is present and that punishment connects you with punishment associated with your childhood it straight away brings up all those fears and now you don't want to investigate when investigation is really just a slow unfolding of truth over a period of time and you can't expect to absorb all the truths of the universe in one sitting if anybody could have done that then it would already have been done um, there's six billion people on the planet surely one of them would have done it sooner or later so so the reality is that unfolding of truth is what we have to expect yeah. I think it's beautiful though because I feel that that's a part of God teaching us how to be humble like you can't go into that process in an arrogant place of uh, I'm going to look good the whole way through this I'm going to never you know I'm, you have to be humble enough to experiment and go oh, that didn't work or oh. and and through that process you learn to feel yourself more and learn to uh, recognize that hey this is my brother and my sister and no one's got a higher status you know we're all in this process a, a humbling process to get to know God I think that's beautiful and my personal experience has been that um, as if you take away all the ridicule and all the anger of other people the actual process of making mistakes and finding out truth in the process is actually quite enjoyable but if you then add in the ridicule and the anger of other people now it becomes very unenjoyable and, and to me that's the problem is that if we stop ridiculing each other for making mistakes and we stop ridiculing each other for investigating truth and we stop ridiculing each other then in the end the capacity of the human race to grow more rapidly exponentially increases because at the moment you've got to put up with the ridicule of everyone before you discover something new and, and then all of a sudden people start accepting it only if it's proven 100% and so forth. Whereas we could be in this process as a human race where we could be discovering new thing after new thing after new thing if there wasn't this huge resistance emotionally to doing so. So what was your question? My question is, I was trying to apply what I have because I've been in this session in Melbourne in Saturday and Tuesday. Yep. So I was trying to do what you say about release or feel the fear or release the fear. I can put you the example. Yep. I've been uh, working in the Northern Territory in a mine site. Yeah. So in order to get there, it's a very remote it's area. It's not the perfect place to feel your fear, is it? <laughs> no, 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 I wouldn't say that. <laughs> yeah. But in order to get there, you have to get a few planes. Second day, they're very small. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't like much flying. flying. So yeah. I wouldn't say that I'm scared, but I don't like much flying. Yeah. So sometimes you got a very rough flying, very rough landing. Yeah. So you got fear. Yeah. So I was saying to myself, okay, feel the fear, feel the fear. Yeah. But I couldn't get to there. So you don't, because you say, you, you see that it doesn't work. So you start to ask for help, you know, to the Archangel Michael or whatever yeah. angel to hold the yeah. plane. Yeah. Because you've seen that it's moving too much. <laughs> and it doesn't look like the ground's coming no, up at the no. right speed. Yeah. That their hostess look boring. Yeah. <laughs> when the air hostess looks worried and that the landing has been <laughs> yeah. very rough yeah so how do you feel that fear to release that fear because it's what you always say but i don't know how to do the it the first though. secret to feeling your fear is to stay in your body yeah i done that and i just had a little bit of shaking but yeah. then you stop and you ask for help or whatever so can i stop. illustrate so though how to stay in your body <coughs> yeah. the key of staying in your body is your breathing Right, your breath. If you're breathing into your diaphragm area, there's a higher likelihood of you staying in your body than if you breathe in your chest. Yes. When you're scared, you stop breathing. Exactly. Yeah. When you're scared, you hold your breath or you go to your chest and <laughs> go really short breath. The key is to go back into your diaphragm when you're breathing and then just to allow the feeling to arise and, and, and whatever effect it has on your body. Now, where, where most people control their fear is through their breath. So the way, way most of us have learnt to control fear is by breathing shallowly or breathing in our chest or holding our breath altogether. And those methods that we've learnt have to be un unlearned. Now, it took me, I had lots of fear to deal with in my life, and it, and it took me nearly two years to learn how to breathe. And what I used to do was uh, I would go jogging and because jogging you, you're having to suck in huge amounts of air 
um, in order just to keep everything functioning. So in the process of doing that, I started to focus on breathing into my stomach while I was jogging rather than into my chest. And you try it, it's very hard initially, particularly if you're used to doing uh, differently. And then what I would also do is I'd lay down on the bed and I'd breathe into this area of my 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 diaphragm in this area, the tummy, fill up that first and then instead of breathing out, I would then also fill up my chest. So breathe it, you try doing that if you and then it's like that's as far amount of air as I can get in, right? And then and then just let it out without control. So most of us go right? that's controlled let it out without any control and see what it feels like. In other words, recycle it all in and then go, <sighs> you know what I mean? Like just, and practice breathing like that a few, at least for a few minutes every single day. What I did, I used to do that every day. And I found the more I did that, the more it allowed me to connect to my fear. It was sort of like getting my body to learn how to accept the fear. Um, and if you're out of your body, you're not going to ever uh, feel your fear or many other emotions for that matter. But if you stay breathing and really focus on your breathing, feel your body, feel its pains and aches, staying in your body and feel its aches rather than try to avoid them. What you'll find is that soon after you start that process with prayer about staying in that process, and desire, your desire of course is a large part of this, stay in that process, you'll find the fear will start coming up. You'll start noticing when you're laying down for instance doing that, that all of a sudden parts of your body start, you know, like twitching or just you'll feel different relief occur in different joints as well and you, you'll feel that uh, things start twitching and moving around and then after a while as you continue doing it you'll start actually even getting teary when you, you, you'll find you'll think of a fearful thing and all of a sudden feel a bit teary so that's a good sign that, that, that everything's starting to shift. If you need help doing it my suggestion is to do what I did and that is to find a person who does some kind of mind body therapy where they focus on your body rather than your intellect so much and they get you to actually be in your body feeling what your body feels and and that I found I needed a lot of help I needed a year and a half of that before I could actually and during that year and a half is when I felt most of my fears so so sometimes you need to sort of go along to somebody else who's who's you know, versed in all of those things to feel your fear. Another thing that's very handy that I found very handy and Mary's found very handy is actually having some form of massage that doesn't go into the extreme. In other words, it, it keeps you on the edge of pain, but not so much pain that you want to go out of your body. Does that make sense? So in other words, you can feel the pains and you can feel it coming up. And if the person is open emotionally, and that's the key thing, the, the therapist needs to be open to you having a cry if you need to have a cry or for you to shake if you need to shake. Um, and I've found many therapists open to a woman doing it, but not many open to a man doing it, unfortunately, because there's all this projection at the male that he should be stronger than that and all those kind of things. But if you can find an appropriate therapist to do that, that also does assist quite a lot, just the process of having massage, because inside of your tissues of your of your muscles the 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 once you're in your body the emotions will be reflected in the body's tissues so as a result of that when you get some massage or some form of uh, f some form of body therapy you'll find that the emotions will come up more readily but for most people like for me i had extreme amount of fear and mary has an extreme amount of fear so for us uh, going through it has taken a couple of years to connect with our fear and, uh, and for me, it took uh, a couple of years. To, I was quite connected with my fear, but it took me a year and a half to feel it, just all of my fears. I, um, for Mary, you'd say that you've only just started to connect to it probably in the last eight months or so, wouldn't you? Yep. 
Definitely. Um, There's lots more to process. And I had to work on my desire. Uh, like, uh, I, um, I would get to that point, feel it, feel it, and then, then you know how where you go, oh, not working, back to the archangel. Yeah. Um, that's the point. I realised I had to go soft because I was, like, getting, ah, oh, panic, and it's, it's going... Soft to the panic, if you like. I, I softening find it hard into to your fear, or yeah. softening into your feelings, like being. Do you Let see, we're, we're very me. judgmental of feelings yeah. as a human race. We're very judgmental of feelings, and we're often very judgmental of our own because we feel a large degree of feelings of weakness when we have a feeling. So society generally, when you cry, automatically views that state as weak, right? When you're uh, for, for men it's much better to be angry than cry because society views that as a strong state. Right? So we have a lot of judgment about, about feeling the feelings inside of us and that judgment causes us to, when we get close to them, to skip out of it. The key is to allow yourself to work through your judgments. And for me, I had very little judgments after I allowed myself to sort of feel ashamed of myself, I suppose is the best way to put it. Like... I, I was uh, very detuned from emotions until the point where I felt like I was allowed to have a break, breakdown, I called it. Like I was allowed to connect to my grief. And once I allowed myself to connect to my grief, it didn't matter who was there as to what I did. I still allowed the grief to flow. It's taken a while for you to do the same thing, hasn't it, babe? Like yep. um, when you... There's been a time when you felt like you were going to be humiliated if you demonstrated any emotion. Yep. Um, so, so you've sort of got to get over these blocks that we have towards, towards fear. And a lot of that is about humiliation and feelings of like that other people will control us or other people will laugh at us. Or, you know, th those kind of feelings have it's to be gotten through It's a common thing first. that's said to a lot of men, even by their dads, isn't it? Don't let them see you're afraid. They'll just you know, use that against you. And you Don't know. be a weak man, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Is a, and they don't necessarily say it like that. Do they? Usually so you have to know where that fear comes from. Because I was wondering if it comes from the fear of death or not when you are in that situation. I, I feel you just need to know why you feel like you can't surrender to the fear. The fear will tell you why you're afraid. Yep. The fear will tell you why you're afraid when you surrender to it. And then you'll know what I'm afraid of. But at the moment you're blocking that, you kind of want to know where it's going to go before you go into it. But the emotion always knows its way home to its cause. <laughs> you just have to let it take you, yeah. But the, it's the block, I think, that to focus on. What so am I afraid of happening if I let fear overwhelm me? So, yeah. so if, you, if you let yourself see this is a general way of settling into your emotions. Like initially we start with our addictions and our addictions are all the things that we do to prevent ourselves from feeling our fears. So, so, you know, every addiction we have, whether it's a physical addiction of some kind or an emotional addiction, which is far more, um, I suppose you'd insidious. say far more insidious, but also far more popular, uh, emotional addictions. Um, whether, whatever the addictions they are, they prevent you from, from accessing the fear. So you could say your addictions cover over the blocks to your fears. The blocks are things like how much judgment you have about feeling your emotions, how much judgment you have about fear. As, as males, we often have more judgment about fear than females do. So females generally are allowed to feel afraid and us men come to their rescue. Does that make sense? Now, what does the man do when the man feels afraid? You have to look. Who comes to his rescue, right? Just you have to look like cool in the place. Yeah, you have, to, cool. you have to look yeah. like, yeah, I'm not that I'm afraid. I'm in control. I'm yeah. in control, you know. <laughs> you know, this is where we go, isn't it? Like, we, we're constantly, um, as males, we're constantly portraying that we've got things under control. We're, we're right. It's only the women that are a bit weak and like that, you know. They need our help, don't they? You know, and all this kind of thing. The reality is that most men feel just as much fear as most women feel. And not only that, they then cover over that fear with a layer of addictions, which, which eventually results in their anger. So when we're into the angry place, we're actually covering over the fact that our addictions are not getting met. And uh, so usually with our blocks, we either go addictively or into anger. And that's where most men go with most of their fears. So if we can see what our blocks are, and a lot of the blocks are judgments. The woman won't think I'm a sexy male 
if I'm crying in front of her or feeling afraid. When she feels afraid and then I feel afraid, she then feels that I'm not protecting her anymore. That's a big thing for many males. If, if she feels afraid and then I or she's crying and I feel afraid and I, don't, and I show that fear to her, she feels that less attracted to me. There's a, so there's how a lot of men treat you how other well. men treat you when you're afraid. I think in my case is, I, I feel if I'm afraid, you know, because I may think that's going to be an accident or whatever. Yeah. It's because I'm afraid of death. If I'm afraid of death, it's because I don't believe that God exists. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. And I feel that session that you talk about truth, yeah. I think it was on Tuesday or Saturday. The one about I, how do we find yeah, out the truth, truth about God or yeah. the truth about anything. Yeah. I think I have reached the conclusion that God exists, yeah. you know, through na nature, you yeah. know, just contemplating nature, you got the feeling that God exists. Yeah. Or Sometimes you behave in a way that you think that is not. You behave so well, or you got that the right, you know, word for somebody that you may think that it's not coming from me. This come from something else. Yeah. So this yeah. is not me. Yeah. I know, you know, so good or whatever. You know, yeah. to the wise or to enlightened. So you've come to accept that there's probably a God, but you're yet to come to accept the the physical danger of living yeah. life, yeah. shall we say. No, but had dying, I wouldn't like to die. Yeah, would not yeah. like to die. Yeah. And so therefore, uh, uh, so one thing that can help with fears a lot is truth. So once we start investigating truth more thoroughly, and one way to deal with the fear of death is to ask yourself a lot of questions about death and also talk to a lot of people who talk to spirits who, who have died to find out what it's like when you pass and all of these other things, you know, talk, talk about it with people. What we do most of the time with subjects such as death is like, how often do we even speak of it? We don't even use the term death. So, so when, so, when so, oh, I went to a funeral today, like... No, who passed? Who passed? No, like we don't even use the term died. Who died? We, we're even afraid of the whole word even, let's face it, let alone... Death is the same as... Well, I feel death is sleep and that's the same as passing, but the majority of people use the term passing or something like that to, to lessen the impact of the word death because we don't want to face our own mortality most of the time, right? So investigate it. So rather than what I've found with all of my fears, and in the first century I had very few fears, but this century I've had lots and lots of them, and so I've had to deal with them, right? And what I've found with all of them, they're far better off going into than away from. So you're far better off jumping into them than you are trying to run away from them. Every time you try to run away from them, you're never going to resolve them. You're far better off jumping in. So, so if I've got a fear of death, I investigate death. I talk to people who have been on their deathbed. I, t I go along and see all these old fellas in, in a, you know, in a nursing home. Nursing home. Uh, I don't know why they call it a nursing home. But anyway, um, you know, you go and see these old people in the nursing home and you talk to them about what about how do they feel about their impending death <laughs> that'd be a conversation stopper <laughs> wouldn't that be a good thing because because many of them have resolved the issue actually right so so my suggestion is to actually and then talk to some mediums who say they talk to the dead so talk to them about i used to go to the spiritual insurance yeah, yeah 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 do all of that investigate as much as you possibly can about the subject of death and then as you're doing it, feel your feelings about every one of those discussions. So when you're looking at the old man laying there who's now lost use of most of his limbs and he's having to have a person turn him over just to keep him com comfortable, what are you feeling? You're feeling, I, I hope I'm never in that condition. I hope I die instantly. <laughs> That's how a lot of people feel when they see that occur, right? I hope I die instantly and you know because I don't want to go through this terrible feeling of like being helpless before I die um, that's a big emotion for most of the human race right um, when you see a person who's had an accident and they're pretty cut up and or even nearly passing and um, how do you feel in that place a lot of times we feel helpless 
like we want to help them but we don't know what to do and so a lot of times death triggers our own feelings of helplessness and our feelings we need to experience now once we've experienced these emotions you'll find they'll leave you and you won't have a fear of death and in fact you'll just view death as a, a, a transition it's sort of like going out to the shop in theory i see like that yeah in theory but, probably but it's not going to be in you yeah. like we talked you know a few weeks ago when we had the discussion about truth yeah. um it's not going to be in you until you experience that place yeah. so the key is to be patient with yourself until you experience that place as well and understand that until you experience that place there's more investigation that needs to be taken that's all just investigate more investigate more until you've resolved the issue and you can feel inside of yourself it's all resolved now yeah thank you all right